Are you ready? This is a discussion podcast about wrestling. This episode was recorded October 28th, 2017. Hello everyone and welcome to the Flip the Mic podcast with myself, MVL Gaming and the Gonin Monkey. Now in a new form. <laughs> yeah, so our topics tonight are WWE Supernat Lucha Underground, Ultima Lucha Trez, the future of Impact Wrestling and the downfall of Impact Wrestling, the future of 205 Live and the downfall of 205 Live. Uh, so we've brought it down to four topics instead of six. Uh, we had our pay-per-view length first episode, but now we're going to cut it down to a SmackDown Live length rather than a three-hour Raw. Yeah, we figured it would take a bit too long to get out otherwise if we kept doing the Raw-length episodes every two weeks. <laughs> yes, and you know, there's so much out there. It's it's hard to watch. I mean, I, I said it last time. With uh, We're not hard to watch. You should definitely watch us. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason we don't have any video. <laughs> but yes, there's so much wrestling out there. It's, I'm going to sidetrack for just a second talking about the length of the shows. I think I said this last time, that Raw is three hours. Mm. SmackDown is two hours. You want to watch 205, that's another hour. You want to watch NXT, that's another hour. The pay-per-views are like at least three hours to four hours long. Mm. Sometimes longer than that. That's a lot of wrestling. And, and that- if you want to watch Lucha on the ground as well, that's another hour. <laughs> and let's say you're still with Impact Wrestling. I kind of want to watch it again, but like it went real bad for one point. It's time for me to go back to it. But that's another hour. <laughs> Nobody can watch everything. Because yeah. if you want to still watch like Ring of Honor on top of that, mm. and if you want to watch like more of the indie shows as well, or you want to watch like AAA Wrestling, or you want to watch New Japan Pro Wrestling, like that's a lot of wrestling. Yeah, and if you were going to add on uh, some of the British stuff like Progress and kind of what culture wrestling as well, that's another good bunch of hours oh, as well. Oh, for sure, for sure. It's so hard to be in the know with absolutely everything right now mm. because we're in a digital age where you have access to everything, but there's so much of it. There's only so many hours in the week. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a religion if you want to follow every single wrestling company. You like have to dedicate yourself wholly to the wrestle. <laughs> It really is. I mean, like, the things I watch every night, it takes ages to get through, you know, Raw, and then you want to watch 205. It takes ages to get through them. Mm. So, yeah, since we've uh, kind of mentioned it, I suppose we might as well get started on a kind of similar note to our first episode. So, MVL, Impact Wrestling's still not doing well, is it? (laughs) Well, well, Impact Wrestling, what an interesting company that is. What a... (laughs) fun time it must be to work for impact wrestling when the employees don't know what's going on and you know they state as much on twitter if you ask them what's going on with your company who's in charge of your company (laughs) they don't even know oh god they don't know what's going on that's how great it is and we're talking about crew that work on impact wrestling they just recently let go uh robbie e who has been there for quite a while now i mean i would have thought he was a corner soon he got some reality tv work from that he did really well for himself Hmm. uh but now he's gone and he's one of many releases they've had over a long period of time as they seek to cuss cots. Uh, but um, one release we should really talk about, Impact Wrestling, and I mentioned this briefly last time, has now officially parted ways with Jeff Jarrett, as in he's gone. Oh. He's gone. It's, it's no longer Global Force Wrestling. It's definitely Impact Wrestling. It's definitely Impact Wrestling <laughs> this time. Uh, and this is four months after merging the Impact Wrestling titles with the Global Force Wrestling titles. <laughs> It's no longer Global Force Wrestling. How awesome is that? (laughs) Uh, So it's kind of like, just to throw in an obscure anime reference, it's kind of like Vegeta. You're told that this fusion is going to be permanent and then it just randomly splits apart a couple of episodes down the line. (laughs) I mean, what a mess. What a complete mess. (laughs) I mean, uh, JJ has been saying on Twitter that Anthem are out of money. It kind of sounds like a spiteful thing to say, but you can believe it because a little while ago there were rumours that Anthem was out of money. And Anthem wanted to sell Impact Wrestling only a couple of months after acquiring it. Uh, that's where the uh, talk of WWE coming in and sweeping it up. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, Impact Wrestling was on a poll that WWE sent out about what content would you like to see on the WWE Network. Ring of Honor was on there as well, but it's really interesting that WWE doesn't own Impact Wrestling. It's not like a WWE <laughs> ECW situation where they're secretly funding it money. Although that might explain how they're somehow still in business. Mm. It is kind of interesting that WWE have just put those two uh, wrestling shows on there as if to say, yeah, we can buy them if you want us to. Yeah, I think it's the point that they're like, 
if we wanted this, we could just have it. <laughs> I mean, from from what I understand, WWE has a good relationship with Ring of Honor. Hmm. I mean, not so much the Young Bucks, who were on Ring of Honor, and now they're on New Japan Pro Wrestling in the Bullet Club, after their whole invasion of Raw Angle, which uh, not someone fired, actually. Someone, a uh, WWE member of staff, I better look this up and be correct. Hmm. I was about to say, it definitely doesn't sound like they're in good shape because, yeah, normally with wrestling companies, it actually takes someone doing something drastic like the Bullet Club stuff to get them fired. But in, in with this, it just sounds like they're just letting them go for no reason other than we just can't afford to have you anymore. Yeah, okay, so it was uh, Jimmy Jacobs. So Jimmy Jacobs took a Twitter photo with the Bullet Club and he got fired. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which is really crazy. Uh, a member of the creative team there let go for just taking a picture with the Bullet Club. That's how mad they are at the Young Bucks, especially for using the suck it pose. They really hate that. <laughs> Where it seems to be fine for them to use the too sweet from the Bullet Club. Admittedly too sweet, obviously from, you know, the NWO. But nevertheless, I don't feel you can really copyright a hand pose. Mm. Or groin thrust, well, in this case. On top of that, there's also the question, would you really want to? I mean, <laughs> it, it's not exactly something respectable you can bring into court, saying, these guys have defiled our patent on the suck my dick pose, so... <laughs> yeah. I mean, the club definitely is not in any way like the Bullet Club. It's not like they have <laughs> ammunition and skulls with gas masks on their gear or anything like that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, WWE seems to have this very weird sense of ownership of a lot of aspects of wrestling. Well, yeah, another thing is that something that's really crazy is Jeff Jarrett. He is apparently, and this is just a crazy rumour, it's probably not true, but he's apparently been checked into rehab, a WWE-sponsored rehab. Now, that's really crazy, mm. because Bruce Man hates Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> and although Jeff Jarrett was a former Intercontinental Champion, they have a really bad history Jeff Jarrett refused to work a show, he held on to a title, and, you know, if you refuse to do a show and you're trying to, you know, essentially hold the title hostage, where you're saying, I'm leaving this company, I think he was going to WCW at the time, and he just wanted the payoff for the next show, it was a really bad situation, mm. and it's, it's created a bad blood between Vince and Jeff Jarrett, especially when they had the WCW come to WWE when they acquired it in that awful invasion angle, we got that little bit of TV where Vincent Mann said, Ah, Jeff Jarrett, you're fired. Oh, wow. Or more correctly, you're fired! <laughs> so it's very confusing that uh, WWE would sponsor his rehab. Hmm. I mean, unless it's kind of like that a part of that statistic angle of, Yeah, sure, you can go into rehab, just sign this contract that forces you to work for us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe... I mean, this is throwing it out there, but maybe they are trying to get some ground on Impact Wrestling, and maybe they just want Jeff Jarrett on their side, because he at one point owned the company. And he, if anyone can get them in there, he probably can. Yeah. It does seem to uh, be heading that way, especially since, like you said, Impact Wrestling has not had that much of a great reputation recently. No, I mean, the reason they changed Global Force Wrestling is because they had such a bad stigma for the name Impact Wrestling. TNA Impact Wrestling, everyone knows about their debts, everyone knows about their public shaming, everyone knows about the Twitter beef with the Hardy Boys. It's all a really bad thing that they want to get away from. And because of that, they changed to Global Force Wrestling. Well, now Global Force Wrestling seems like a joke. They were there for, what, a couple of months, and then they changed back to Impact Wrestling because of a huge fallout with Jeff Jarrett. Do we have any idea? I mean, I know it's all rumors and speculation. Do we have any idea of what the fallout was about? Was it just money, or...? Oh, the, the fallout, I mentioned it last time, Jeff Jarrett was throwing tortilla chips oh, at, God, that's at the right. Mexican crowd, <laughs> and Anthem had had enough. I mean, Jeff Jarrett was already being a bit uh, cumbersome backstage, and he's already, let's say, a difficult character to deal with, and they'd had enough with him. I mean, I respect Jeff Jarrett for everything he does in the ring, but some of his, uh, some of his outside of the ring or his business ventures have been a bit puzzling, to say the least. Mm. Global Force Gold comes to mind, which was an actual gold pyramid. <laughs> I mean, the last time, it's crazy that that was a thing. Yeah, I think I could just sort of blot that from my mind. Jeff Jarrett was still under contract with WWE, but it was about to expire, and he was going to head over to WCW with the WWF, at the time, Intercontinental Championship. And he basically blackmailed Vince McMahon handing over the title to drop it to China. To my knowledge, China is the only woman to have held the Intercontinental Champion. Yeah, that... It's kind of understandable why Vince wouldn't 
well, he wouldn't be entirely on friendly terms with someone who is basically holding one of your babies hostage. I mean, I don't know if he yeah. sees his titles as babies. Maybe he does. Who knows? <laughs> I'm going to correct what I said earlier, because it comes to mind that Molly Holly definitely held the hardcore championship for a small amount of time. Hmm. I remember that happening. She hit Hurricane Helms. There's a hurricane coming through. She hit him <laughs> in the face with something in the hardcore match. Uh, the hardcore title could be won at any time. It had a 24-7 rule force count anywhere. So if you had the hardcore title, you could lose it at any point. You know, if you fell asleep, someone could technically just put their hand on you. If there was a referee there to count the three, you could lose the title. <laughs> uh, but I remember Hurricane Helms won the title, was running away. Molly Holly hit him in the face, won the title. And then the same night, she lost the title to someone else. I have no idea who that was. But it was cool to see Molly win the hardcore title. That was awesome. So that belt was kind of like money in the bank back in the day. Yeah, I mean... Raven won that title like a million times. Like I, I don't know what the amount is, but Raven has held almost more titles than anyone else, and most of those title reigns are the hardcore title, and most of those reigns probably last in the minute ah. because of how that title works. Uh. Um, it was funny because remembering back, Molly Holly was a uh, Hurricane sidekick at the time, and she was under the Mighty Molly name, so she was a superhero as well. So it was really strange. I actually uh, played against when I did the uh, Day of Reckoning. Uh, let's play on my channel a long time back. Ah, yes. And, uh, she was bold at the time because she'd had her head shaved in a hair versus hair match. Ah, right. And that's just a strange bit of trivia that comes to mind on that. Hmm. But yeah, getting back to Impact Wrestling. Impact Wrestling. I mean, it's a shame because I know there's there's some awesome stuff coming up. They've got their pay-per-view coming up where Gail Kim's stepping back in the ring, even though she's retired. Hmm. Uh, she's having to take the place of uh, one or two knockouts that have left the company since, uh, because they're losing members of their roster all the time. Yeah, I mean, when they have these crazy deals where they want to source of your income, which was the same with Jeff Hardy, and it was even the case with Eden, they wanted some of her income for a film. Hmm. Um, it's crazy. I don't know what they're really playing at. I know they need funds because... Um, Impact Wrestling has to be hemorrhaging money. Mm. It has to be just dropping. I can't imagine their house shows are very full. I've seen footage back in the day when I was more interested in Impact Wrestling. I've seen footage of near empty arenas. And that was certainly the case with Global Force Wrestling when they were live. Yeah. They had near empty arenas. Uh, they had a football stadium with a wrestling ring and about 20 or 30 people. Yeah, they, they were keeping shots fairly low to the front rows, not trying to look up. Yeah, I mean, there's that old tactic of you dip the lights and only have people at the front, <laughs> and that's really cool. And I, that can actually look really good, because I know in NXT, even though they have a full amount of people there, they still dip the lights, because they want to keep the focus on the ring, and I really appreciate that. Mm. NXT is a very well-filmed show, but definitely benefits from being in the same location every time. Yeah. Uh, whereas Impact Wrestling was filmed in Orlando Studios, there was that point where they weren't going to pay their production crew, and they had the money, <laughs> so they had to get in a lot of trouble there. But... We could talk on and on about the problems of Impact Wrestling. If they are that many, that's why they wanted to get away from that name. Mm. And who knows? Who knows if they'll be here next year? Yeah, but... I mean, really. <laughs> it's been horrendous for them these last couple of years. They've jumped from network to network. Mm. And it's just not working out for them. Yeah, because I can understand that you'd be a bit desperate if you are actually in the red, but a lot of the decisions sound like they're incredibly short-sighted, to be honest. Like, uh, I mentioned uh, last time, it seems really weird that when you have a handful of stars and you want to keep them on your side, but at the same time, you're aggressively trying to take a piece of any pie they create, whether or not it's related to them or not. Yeah, I mean, they've changed public face at least four times over the last year. They went from Dixie Carter to Billy Corgan to Jeff Jarrett, and now it's all over the place. Yeah, I don't know who their main star would be. I mean, I know they're uh, really pushing Jolly Impact and Tyre Valkyrie, as they're known, um, and also Rosemary and Gail Kim and the knockout section, but... Yeah, well, they're going to have a bit of a problem when uh, Gail Kim actually does retire, because that's going to leave a big gap in the knockout division. Mm. I admittedly haven't been watching Impact Wrestling. I do want to get back to it, but then I just think about those long, drawn-out talking segments that Dixie Carter used to open the show with, where they just didn't have content going on. Mm. It's bad enough in WWE when you get the show opening up with the authority coming out and mm. just eating up time. <laughs> you know, I mean, you could tell people what matches are happening that evening in different ways. Mm. As much as that's building up heat, it's just difficult to watch. Yeah. And that was a problem I had when I sort of got out of Impact Wrestling. I do want to check it out. They've got that big pay-per-view slammiversary coming up. 
Gail Kim is going to be wrestling. There's going to be a lot of cool stuff going on. Mm. Like, I kind of want to check it out. I mean, with uh, with Lucha Underground coming to a halt, I might have maybe an hour or two a week mm. spare. <laughs> Yeah. It's just if I want to put it towards Impact Wrestling, that's what I'm under debate. Yeah, thinking something similar, I'm trying to decide whether it's Impact or Progress, but um, yeah, it's that kind of thing. For what I like, checked a few because when we were starting this podcast and um, you mentioned you were going to talk about Impact Wrestling, I did check out some of their stuff, and yeah, I think it's kind of confusing because they're doing the same tactic of WWE of doing of trying to get all of their wrestlers into the ring because she ended up being part of a freeway feud where she had um rosemary and oh i really wish i could remember her name but that yeah it was uh there was rosemary and another wrestler who had a lot either rosemary on one team and then there were three other knockouts on the other so yeah there's this like whole freeway feud going on which is a bit confusing and hard to follow ali yeah, I think it was I Ali. don't it, want to say who it was, because I don't know. I haven't been watching. Yeah, I think her name was Ali. I'm not... But don't quote me on that. I could have mistaken it for it was someone else. But yeah, there was a... There was, she and Rosemary had a recent alliance, and then Gail Kim joined in for reasons that escape me right now. It was a bit confusing. I mean, granted, I was watching the highlights, so there was some context I could have missed, but it did seem like they were just kind of throwing wrestlers in the ring and hoping well, think- something stuck. <laughs> Gail Kim is what they're adding to anything in the women's division, or the knockouts division as it's called, mm. in TNA, which I actually really like as a name. The knockouts title sounds really mm. cool. She's in a position where AJ Styles is in WWE, where if something's not working, sprinkle a little bit of AJ Styles on it, <laughs> and it probably works out. I mean, AJ Styles, the biggest thing to come out of Impact Wrestling. Uh. Like, that's probably not an argument. Mm. Like, I know people might say a lot of good stuff has come out, but when you think of Impact Wrestling, you want to think of one wrestler. You think of AJ Styles. Mm. Quick, did the Mahal all still not working as a champion from AJ at him? <laughs> no, I think I think Jinder Mahal's doing all right because um, when they're trying to appeal to that demographic, like they've done some crazy things with him. I mean, doing the kind of doing the racist stuff against Shinsuke was really cringeworthy. Mm. But I think the true test for Jinder will be when he faces Brock Lesnar and seeing yeah. if that works out because Jinder has gone from a jobber all the way up to champion, mm. and I really want to see how they present. Jinder Mahal. And I really don't want to see a two-minute match where Jinder gets like no offense and he's just suplexed around the ring. Mm-hmm. I want to see him get the Colossus in and then maybe a big kick to the face and get some offense going. Because the commentators seem to think somebody has had a good amount of offense against Brock Lesnar if they get him in about one or two throws. <laughs> like, that was pretty good. That's more than the last guy did. You were fighting him for ooh, a good two and a half minutes. That's better than anyone so far. Yeah, it's one of those weird things. It's like... Um... To quote little Karibo in um, uh, Brock Lesnar's match against Goldberg, the two wrestlers use their special moves over and over again, which in any other match would be awful, but here it's great for some reason. (laughs) That's true. Yeah, that match, the Goldberg match, was really, really bad. I mean, it was good because you wanted to see somebody fight Brock, but Goldberg clearly wasn't, and I mean this in the nicest way, but Goldberg had been out of the ring for a very long time. He clearly wasn't able to deliver a long match. Mm. I mean that in the nicest way. Goldberg is amazing. Mm. But they obviously kept that match short. And the one before it, which is even shorter, that length for a reason. Yeah. Very little going on in those matches. Mm. But, yeah, it probably says something about Impact Wrestling that we keep drifting from it to other topics. <laughs> It is. It's just. It's so unstable. You almost don't want to stand next to it. <laughs> it's at that point. You think, if I stand next to Impact Wrestling, am I going to fall in and then own the company and then be kicked out? <laughs> yeah. I mean, even just from a viewer's perspective, you're thinking, do I really want to get invested in this storyline? Because there's a chance it can just fall over and then there'll be no resolution from it ever again. Yeah, I'm getting very scared now, the more I mention it, that Flip the Mic podcast may become the new owners of Impact. (laughs) Uh, Just suddenly we'll wake up and there's an email saying, could you please decide the next few matches for the pay-per-view? Wait, what? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine that. I would probably put EC3 in every match if he's still with them. (laughs) Uh, Johnny Impact versus, I don't know, everyone? Um... <laughs> Johnny Impact versus Johnny Impact. <laughs> we'll do it Mortal Kombat style. He'll just fa- he'll face himself in alternate gear. It's bound to be an amazing match. <laughs> the crowd will hate both people so much, it'll be amazing. <laughs> be like, I hate that Johnny Mundo so much. I really hope Johnny Mundo kicks his ass. <laughs> 
Oh, God. But it seems to be like that's the biggest fear of um, Impact Wrestling, is just don't stand near it in case something else happens. Yeah, um, they had that problem where I was praising them for how they shot their episodes where they filmed a bunch at once, but then you get that problem where they have those guys for those, let's say, eight episodes they film. They might not have access to those same people for the next eight they film, and then they just end up being really disjointed with their storylines. Mm. It is getting to be that kind of big problem, and it really doesn't put a lot of confidence in the viewers. In fact, it'll just, um, I have a suspicion it'll be like, you turn your back for five seconds, you turn around, and then they've had to move location, half the roster's gone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know that Lucha Underground was wanting to change location to somewhere where it's a bit cheaper to film. Impact Wrestling is a good spot where it's good to film, but they really could do with sorting out how they go around their production, mm. because it's, it's getting crazy. <laughs> where are they getting their money from? It's certainly not pop TV. It's definitely not there. Are they going to do it with their new online venture, their new WWE Network clone? No, definitely not. Hmm. How are they making money there? There's there's no money to be made there. Yeah, at this point, I can't believe I'll say this, but part of me wants the WWE to come in and buy them uh, just to put them out of their misery, if nothing else. At the very least, I think we would end up with a lot of content on the WWE Network that we can enjoy hmm. for only nine ninety nine. <laughs> I mean, I, I would hope that they don't use it as an excuse to just uh, merge them with NXT and upset the balance of that show. I think that's slowly happening anyway. I mean, we've had Bobby Roode come in, we've had Thea Trinidad, we've had a lot of NXT talent make its way through into WWE. I mean, let's talk about the success of AJ Styles. Let's talk about Samoa Joe. It's been a huge success. Mm. And now we've got Drew McIntyre as the NXT champion. Mm. You know, we're, we have... The uh, Impact Wrestling stars in WWE right now. Yeah, I suppose that's true. It might be easier just to cut out the middleman and just bring them all over anyway. Yeah, because it, it's basically happening. Yeah, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see in that future. I mean, I have no idea how much that poll could turn down. It's possible that the members of the WWE Universe, or the audience, as most people would call them, might react differently. No, you can't call them the audience. Don't call them that. Also, don't call it a title. It's a championship. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. WRW name is so confusing. <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a whole list of words they can't say. Mm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was. But, yeah, it really depends how the WWE universe reacts to the idea, because there might be one or two stubborn fanboys who just want to keep it separate for, I don't know, pettiness. Oh, wow. Okay, so there are eight pages of words that WWE announcers aren't allowed to say. Oh, God. They're not allowed to say this business. They can't <laughs> refer to it as a business. They, the belt can't be called a belt or a strap. They can't say feud. It's rivalry. <sighs> they can't say war. That's really strange. They can't <laughs> they say can't... unpopular. It's polarizing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, they can't say a performer. They can't refer to them as that. They can't mention choreograph. That makes sense. Hmm. They can't say house show. They have to call it live event. Hmm. They can't say backstage. <laughs> they have to say in the back or in the locker room. Oh, God. They can't say pro wrestling. Everyone knows they can't say pro wrestling or pro wrestler. They have to say superstar yeah. or athlete. <laughs> uh, they can't say international. They have to say global. That's hmm. strange. They can't say shot. There's no title shots. It's an opportunity. Huh. It's a land of opportunity. They can't say shots. <laughs> they can't say acrobatics. Huh. <laughs> they can't say interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be reading that right. Uh, they can't say interesting. Okay, that's funny. Uh, that's funny. You definitely can't say that in Impact Wrestling. Uh, I know you can't say <laughs> it in School of Movies podcast, but still. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. They can't say DQ. Huh. They can't say talent. <laughs> they can't star, superstar, or diva. I don't think they would like to use diva anymore. Mm. They can't say me or I. That's very funny. What? Yeah, they can't use inside terms like heel, baby face, blown up, shoot, rib, mark, etc. For the U.S., they have to say United States. That's a bit strange. How do they say the U.S. Championship? They say United, United States, States Championship. Championship. Maybe they do. Maybe I haven't heard them yeah, say U.S. They, Championship. They often say the United States Championship, I think. As mentioned before, they can't say fans. They have to refer to the audience as you, or most of the time, as the universe. Uh, they can't say senior fans and stuff like that. They can't say hospital. They have to say medical center. Oh, they can't say faction. They have to use group. When they want to use uh, anything for sale, they have to say now available instead of on sale. It's strange. You think they want to push the on sale. Mm. And yes, they never use the term. The title is on the line. The title will be defended. Mm. They want to say. 
Uh, this is this just... is how I'm trying to avoid talking about Impact Wrestling by looking up all of the terms the WWE can't use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like a possible future, I'm going to add this to WWE, but you're out of your mercy with this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, or put you out of your misery rather. So, uh, speaking of the WWE universe, and things you can and can't say, this is uh, one topic that. It's based around the recent events, but it's something that's got my mind going. Because, um, okay. Now, obviously, we all know... Well, only people who don't watch wrestling know this. That wrestling is uh, scripted. It's faked. It's choreographed and everything. So... What? You know what? <laughs> Are you telling me when that man punches another man, he doesn't feel it? <laughs> uh, I'm sure he feels something. But anyway... <laughs> just want to quickly say, everyone, that the bumps are real. You can't fake that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. Uh, they you also... fall 20 foot through a table, that hurts, yeah. man. That hurts. It's not ballet. They like to say that. It's definitely not ballet. Yeah. Uh, Goldberg came up with the best description that it's not fake, it's predetermined. Yes, that would be accurate. Mm. So, because wrestling is predetermined, they sometimes decide that, as well as giving wrestlers characters, they sometimes want to dip into the supernatural elements. For examples of this... Just go onto YouTube and search for anything related to Kane or The Undertaker. Make sure you do that after listening to the podcast, yeah, though. Obviously. After you smash that like button. <laughs> Put that like button through a table. Indeed. It surprisingly does help. But yeah, um, <laughs> if you do that after listening to the podcast, you will find that such insane moments as The Undertaker scares away Paul Heyman with a lightning bolt and then buries his father in concrete. Uh, Kane yep. tried to drag Zack Ryder into hell only to be stopped by John Cena at the last minute. Kane tried to drag Daniel Bryan's wife into hell only to be stopped by Daniel Bryan. Kane's drag tries to drag a lot of people into hell. You know, my favourite thing about Kane dragging someone down into hell is when he did that to Seth Rollins. Seth Rollins was just there the next week and didn't talk about it. <laughs> he took you down into a a steaming area of red hmm. darkness so you just have him taking you down into the depth of hell next week Seth Rollins is fine he's <laughs> like what I don't want to talk about it Kane probably <laughs> did stuff to me like let's not mention it oh. um, well, I'm talking about Seth Rollins real quick does anyone remember at Wrestlemania when he fought Triple H and the doctors were telling you that Seth Rollins couldn't compete medically he was not allowed to compete, so it had to be an unsanctioned match. Hmm. And he had, let's say, a broken leg or a leg injury that was going to take him out of wrestling if he took any significant injury. And he has the match against Triple H, and then he cures his leg by beating Triple H. Hmm. Because on the next night on Raw, he's fine. <laughs> the doctor said he couldn't compete. And he's that hard because he got out of hell. <laughs> Oh, that's one way to say that storyline, but yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. But Another thing is, a lot of the characters when I was watching WWE in the Attitude Era were some of these dark and supernatural characters that I really liked. I liked the Brood a lot. I liked Edge and Christian and Gangrel, the vampires of WWE. I liked Viscera. I liked this whole Ministry of Darkness angle where the Undertaker and his minions were trying to take over WWE. And the only shame in that is it was revealed that the, the greater intelligence behind this whole Ministry of Darkness was Vince McMahon. Oh. So Vince McMahon had The Undertaker kidnap his own daughter and try and marry her to gain position in the company, apparently. <laughs> but never mind that. That's just that week-to-week booking I kind of rattle on about every now and then. Yeah, it's one of those weird things that happens every once in a while, although it would explain why Vince McMahon seems to never age. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I mean, he took uh, quite a serious bump from Kevin Owens mm. a little while ago. Kevin Owens super kicked him in the face. Uh, more than when he headbutted him and mm. opened up some blood which was allegedly actual blood. Oh, wow. And he dropped a uh, he dropped a frog splash on him. My favourite part about that is uh, there was a guy from the back ran in and tried to get in front of Vince McMahon, but when he saw Kevin Owens coming down, he got out of the way. Now, Vince McMahon is like a millionaire or a billionaire, what have you, <laughs> and you're a guy working for him. You're not going to get in front of this man, who is 70-odd. <laughs> you're not going to take a bump <laughs> with Vince McMahon. I don't understand that. Uh, apparently he's paid the bodyguards well, but not enough. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, that's possibly why, for some reason, in the later year, like the uh, reality era, I believe 
Triple H calling it at one point. Uh, they did, because of all of the reality shows they want to do. Yeah, so they seem to be moving to the idea that WWE is more of a sports drama rather than the supernatural stuff. They've been kind of edging away from it, except for two characters who recently have been the center of feud that's been going way, way too long. Bray Wyatt, who, for those who don't know, is an evil cultist, uh, an evil hillbilly cultist, I should say, that is tied to this evil being called Sister Abigail, and Finn Balor, who can uh, call the powers of Irish mythology to occasionally take on a demon form. Yes, Bray Wyatt would have you follow the buzzards, Mm. a kind of take on a religious leader who mesmerizes and potentially does some kind of mind trick to um, hypnotize and favor you into his cult. And Finn Balor, who is formerly Prince Devitt, Mm from New Japan Pro Wrestling, very, very talented performer mm. as well, came up with a ring name, Finn Balor. Uh, the name itself is based on Irish mythology, which is really interesting. Yeah, there seems to be a lot of basis for that in his character ever since he joined the WWE. And uh, Bray Wyatt has been going around menacing other performers using this cult trick. And the last WrestleMania, he was trying to brainwash uh, Randy Orton. But that turned out to be a convoluted strategy by Randy Orton to try and manipulate Bray Wyatt into a humiliating loss. But... Vintage Randy Orton! <laughs> you don't mess with a viper, yeah. apparently. So, uh, but recently, like I said, the two of them have been in a feud, which kind of started with a simple premise. Bray Wyatt thinks that Finn Balor's demon persona is a load of garbage, and he wants to prove that he has the darker, eviler powers. And they've been kind of going back and forth, and they've been having different matches with uh, Finn using his demon persona in some of them, or in the case of the man versus man match, which uh, I get what they were going for, but you're basically just trying to hype up a singles match, basically. Yeah, we're doing the exact same match we did on the last pay per view, but this time without any face paint. Yeah. And this is our Bray Wyatt, who at WrestleMania lost to The Undertaker and still calls himself the new face of fear. Hmm. And I happen to know from uh, listening to some interviews that Bray Wyatt um, considered himself one of the returning dark characters to WWE. Mm. And in his words, now everybody's doing something crazy in NXT. Everyone's got a lights out entrance. And then he went on to say a guy dresses up like a demon. So I don't know if uh, Bray Wyatt wasn't that happy with other people kind of stepping on his territory with the dark characters. I know that he considered uh, Matt Hardy's broken gimmick to be an infringement upon his character. Mm. Um, having said that, the fans would love to see Broken Matt and Bray Wyatt go at each other in some videoettes. I mean, they had the uh, Bray Wyatt had the compound battle with the New Day mm. that was very, very much taken out of the book of the Broken Universe. And then they had that House of Horrors match, which was just a regular wrestling match where Randy Orton walked around a house and got beaten up every now and then. <laughs> and done with the new room. It was really strange and really boring. Mm. <laughs> uh, could have done a lot with that, but just didn't, seemingly. Yeah. Well, recently, because um, I believe you said last time it was Samoa Joe, maybe someone else who was supposed to go up against Finn Balor, but sustained an injury, so... Yes, it was meant to be Samoa Joe going up against Finn Balor. Yeah, so they've decided to extend it and have it so that Bray Wyatt is... Um, angry at Finn Balor because you lied to me, you lied to me, you claim the demon was a persona, but in fact it's something de- dark hiding within you. So he decides to reveal that he can tap into Sister Abigail. Yeah, this is really interesting because uh, a while ago, Crazy Mary Dobson was who we all thought was going to be Sister Abigail when and if Sister Abigail debuted. Admittedly, they do have a crazy woman character, uh, Nikki Cross, in Sanity in NXT. Um, so maybe they didn't want to cross over there. But yeah, we had thought that Crazy Mary Dobson uh, would have been a perfect fit for Sister Abigail yeah. if they did introduce her as a character. And there was talk about introducing Sister Abigail as a wrestler, as a character, as a way to bring up a woman uh, with a good amount of buzz on the roster. Seemingly, they haven't gone with that. Mm. I still think they could easily have Sister Abigail resurrected at some point, or even possess a female wrestler. Yeah. That'd be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool, but because this feud was about alter egos, I mean, the, when Bray announced that he was going to bring Sister Abigail, people were all abuzz that of the rumors of, oh, which wrestler could it possibly be? Like, I even heard some rumors that it was going to be a returning page. But I kind of knew... I can, I can almost see that working. Yeah, Paige has the right work. look. She couldn't return as Paige. 
It would be it'd have to be a new persona. Yeah. I mean, another problem I have with the quote unquote reality era is that wrestlers just don't have wrestler names. Mm. Like back in the old days, wrestlers have cool names. The Undertaker is a prime example. Everyone says the Undertaker. He's an undead mortician from Death Valley. You know, that's his character. It's ridiculous. Mm. But, you know, that's who he was. And now every wrestler just has a regular name because that's the reality they want to put through. Yeah. But uh, another cool thing we could have is wrestlers have cool names. Hmm. We've started to see that in NXT. The Velveteen Dream is one I particularly like. Yeah, I like him uh, too. A very androgynous character. And he's uh, going after Alistair Black. And he's sort of silky in the way he moves. Hmm. It's a character he hadn't quite got to grips with when he first showed up, but now I think he's getting more into how he plays it and how he moves his body, and it's oh, working yeah. better. When he was going up against Alistair Black, that was like, oh yeah, I'm really sold on this now. Yeah, you got a massive pop when he just dropped down to his knees and sort of slid towards Alistair, and that was great. Mm. But, yeah, getting back, I kind of knew that's not what they were going with, partially because of their ridiculous men can only fight men and women can only fight women shenanigans, but also because... This feud was about alter ego, so I figured they probably were going to go with a Bray Wyatt being possessed angle. The problem was, uh, when this happened, Bray was on the screen, sorry, that's, we can't say that, the Titantron. Good, good save, good save. I thought we were going to lose our announcers job, son. <laughs> the, on the Titantron, he was talking to Finn Balor, who was in the ring, and then there was a fade as he was possessed, and... It was basically Bray Wyatt with some face paint or voice fills and a veil, and to say it didn't go over well is an understatement. I mean, it isn't quite as bad as a Roman Reigns boo, but if you listen carefully on the YouTube <laughs> clip, you can hear people laughing in the audience. Yeah, well, part of the reason they did that, I don't want to say part of the reason, maybe they had that planned anyway, but Bray had been off TV for two weeks mm. around about that point, and that's a viral infection because of you mentioned him earlier, Roman Reigns, Bo Dallas and uh, Bray Wyatt and Jojo, because Bray Wyatt and Jojo are together. They've all had a viral infection hmm. and they've had to, uh, they, they couldn't be on television in their current state. Yeah, I also, because of that, they use those videoettes. Yeah, I kind of figured that. I also um, heard that someone close to Bray was also in the hospital at the time, so he had to do the pre-recorded segments. But regardless, him being possessed did not go down well. I think it was partially because I think the way they framed his reveal didn't make it look... I don't know if they were trying to save the full appearance until after he'd stepped in the ring, but needless to say, it didn't work out very well. So I have to imagine that they're going on Bray Wyatt is possessed by Sister Abigail. Yes. Because you're not going to say that he genuinely believes he's Sister Abigail at this point. Hmm. He's got a giant beard. Like, yeah. he's not going to look down at himself and think, you know, my gender identity is different when I'm in this mindset. When you look at that huge beard, yeah. like, he's, he's a big, hairy guy. He's never going to think about himself as a woman. I don't, that, that might not be right to say. Maybe his character is supposed to do that. Yeah, I mean, um, personally... It's a bit far-fetched. I didn't want to mention it, but yeah, it was... Uh, I mean, he is a difficult body type to work with, so it's... Um... Might not fit it, but yeah, if it was just um, the fact that that reveal didn't land, uh, that, like, we could just put that down to, oh, it's a, uh, another ba mishandled WWE creative decision. But the reason I chose to bring it up was because this and the um, promo that Finn Balor did afterwards where they were trying to retcon the character by uh, the part of the man versus man match by saying that, Oh, Finn Balor doesn't tap into a demon. He just it's a persona based on Irish mythology after because he was bullied as a child or something to that effect. And he gave a promo where he claimed that after seeing Sister Abigail, he realized that the demons uh from his childhood stories, uh they weren't stories, they were real. And he start appears on the Titan Tron and starts to sh reveal some new face paints. But critics didn't like this either. They fans were really digging into it. And not, they were implying that the supernatural elements were the problem. Like, uh, David Meltzer and his co-hosts were saying that it was an embarrassing promo. And one of his co-hosts said, it's a grown-ass man talking about dragons and fairy tales. And hmm. Simon on WhatCulture.com was demanding uh, that after this feud be over and the characters reset because... They thought or that this entire thing was embarrassing and a lot of nonsense. And yet, Kane came back 
in that same episode. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, wow, this is amazing, Kane's back. Another thing the fans are really not happy about is Kane beat Finn Balor on Raw, and they're very, very unhappy about that. Hmm. Because Kane has been for a long time uh, in his uh, last run just somebody to put other people over and seeing Kane. And I thought it was really great to see him go toe to toe with Braun Strowman. We'll probably mm. talk about TLC in a little bit, but Kane has been made to look really strong and really powerful. He was definitely put over in TLC and having him beat Finn Balor, I think was actually the right decision. If you do want to put Kane against Braun Strowman in mm. the future, can't have him lose to Finn Balor. He needs to look strong, especially when I mean, Finn Balor is a fantastic talent, but he's under 200 pounds. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so Kane has to beat this guy. Yeah. He has to. I mean, honestly, I was I wasn't that fussed to a bit because um okay, hey, like I think some of it was fallout from because the whole sister Abigail thing didn't happen because like you said, Bray Wyatt uh, was suffering from an illness. Yeah. Uh, so... I will also say that the new face paint is also a good thing, because that means more toys. Yes. Like they've gotta be thinking towards that. How many variations of Finn Balor's demon can we put out? Yeah, but so I think part of the reason people were raging was because, as a last-minute change, they had Finn Balor go up against AJ Styles in a match, which was awesome, don't get me wrong. Yeah, this was really cool, actually. Originally, they planned to put him up against Chris Jericho. Chris Jericho was not available because of his commitments to Fozzie, hmm. so they chose AJ Styles, which was really cool, because he flew uh, something like 18 hours from his tour to come to that event, and it was still a hell of a match. It was a fan dream match. AJ Styles versus Finn Balor. Two prominent members of the Bullet Club going head to head. Locking horns, as it were. Mm. Too sweet. Indeed. Yeah. Really good. Yeah, it was a good match. But yeah, I honestly, just in terms of like, oh, power levels, fans, I couldn't see Finn Balor beating Kane unless he went demon form. But I think the fact that he was able to beat AJ Styles is the reason some fans were getting fussed. But anyway, the reason why I bring all this up is because... I will admit I'm still fairly new to wrestling, so I was going to ask you this as a genuine question. Is this just a weird thing that's been happening? Like, some wrestling fans want to, like, push away these supernatural gimmicks? Like, is it just the thing that wrestling's trying to move on from that, from, uh, considering childish and or wants to get away from the supernatural stuff? I think this all came because of what was successful in the Attitude Era. you got characters like Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. Admittedly, they were larger-than-life characters, but what was popular, especially about Stone Cold was how he connected with the audience, as he looked like a guy who you could probably find in the crowd drinking a bunch of beer and then kicking somebody's ass down the pub. Hmm. All the bars, they would call it. I'm English, I called it a pub. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's someone that you can relate to, especially when you've got Daniel Bryan, who, who looks like a guy who would be in the audience. He's a one-of-a-kind competitor. Hmm. You want to have these people that are relatable to the audience, especially if you're playing these kind of um, reality TV angles where... One guy is the good guy and one guy is the bad guy. You want to have the bad guy be that boss you've got at work. He's always putting you down. He's never giving you a raise. He makes you work long hours. He doesn't give a damn about you. Mm. You want to have the other guy as a working man's hero who's working hard all the time. And he never seems to get above that glass ceiling. He never gets any higher. Yeah. But that's, that's a story they're running with every single storyline to say. Yeah, and I know they were trying to run a similar angle with Bailey that she's the wrestling fan who's been promoted and is now in the ring. Yeah, definitely. Uh, they want to show you loads of pictures of Bailey's childhood, make her really connecting to the uh, children in particular. I want to say that this is what she wanted to do. She's just like you. Hmm. And then she's made it. So please don't boo her when she's saying she's injured. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, what's that all about? Uh, that was just bizarre. But yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is, because fans have seemed to have gone to this point as well, because like I said, the critics are all uh, claiming it's all supernatural nonsense and it should be out, but then again, every time Kane and The Undertaking came in, they're all, oh my god, it's awesome, so I don't know whether it's just, it's only okay in that era. I found it to be one of the more interesting things about the Attitude Era, that they had people like The Undertaker would string up Big Boss Man, I mean, he hanged him. I mean, and he put him on the cross, and they had all of these crazy, larger-than-life characters. I want to see these characters come back. Yeah, same. And we have that in Lucha Underground, and it works so seemingly. Hmm. Uh, it works so well, I should say. Yeah, I mean, the fact is, yeah, we know it's all scripted and predetermined, so 
it honestly makes more sense to just go with the big, larger than life stuff because having this, like, oh, these are what the people are like in real life, except clearly not because they're on podcasts saying that they don't actually have a hatred of the person at any of the stage. You know? Yeah, except when they say they have a real life hatred against their co-worker, yeah. uh, like Alexa Bliss <laughs> and <laughs> Sasha Banks. Uh, um, but there you have it. Yeah, so I guess. Yeah, it's just something that's baffling me because, like you, I honestly, that's the part of wrestling I enjoy, the idea that these guys are big, over-the-top superheroes, because, yeah, um, some people are going that, oh, it seems uh, like silly and superficial, but, you know, wrestling is like one big form of theatre anyway, so it's that kind of suspension of disbelief, like, yeah, obviously when Kane's dragging someone to hell, he's just putting someone through a hole in the ring, but... You don't go up and say, oh, Romeo didn't really stab that guy. That was so fake. Look at this. It's like, dude, it's all suspension of disbelief, you know? <laughs> I couldn't believe it if somebody sort of stood up in the theatre and just said, that's not blood. I can tell. <laughs> I just left. And it's just that kind of weird attitude they have. I mean, it's just... If nothing else, it'd certainly make the storylines a lot more exciting because, honestly, part of the reason why I like the Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens feud against the McMahons at the moment is because it seems to be about a little bit more than I'm slightly annoyed that you have a championship. Yeah, I mean, we can basically call that Jericho 2, can't we? Mm. (laughs) (laughs) With uh, Sami Zayn taking the place of Chris Jericho. But it is cool. Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens are a great pair. They work really well together. They have done for years through Ring of Honor and the Indies making their way up to WWE. They work very well against each other, but we've seen that a ton. Hmm. So it's good to see Sami Zayn finally get some limelight as well. Because there was that whole thing about him wanting more opportunity on Raw, and then he finally came to SmackDown, and nothing was happening for him. Hmm. Now, I'm not sure I entirely believe that they were just setting up for this angle. I'm not really sure I believe that. Hmm. I think that they they really did have nothing for him, but now it's great to see him get some spotlight. Sami Zayn is a kind of good example of the uh, slight flaws you have with the reality era, because... Yeah, sure, it feels a bit more realistic and grounded, but unless you have some very specific personal feud going on, which he's been doing that with Kevin Owens for so long, it's kind of hard to try and come up with an engaging feud, so a lot of the time he gets pushed to the side a lot. You know what I've noticed? Sami Zayn has the exact same body type and moveset from a certain generic luchador, El Generico. (laughs) Crazy that. (laughs) I, I can't seem to explain it. If you go to Ring of Honor, you see a lot of this El Generico, and he's exactly <laughs> like Sami Zayn. Crazy. Anyhow, mm. you were saying? It's just something I think, between the reality and the fantasy, I kind of prefer the fantasy a bit more, I guess just because it kind of allows for some unique wrestlers that stand out, even if they don't get the title shot. I mean, obviously it's not perfect. You do get stuff like the Gooker, which is probably best not ever mentioned again <laughs> <laughs> quite right but i just feel it has more advantages than disadvantages and yeah i know what some people are going to say that it would be better to focus on the wrestling and not every single wrestling promotion needs to be the same i totally get that but at the same time i think like a mix of both is probably better for a company as big as the wwe because well especially since they seem to be getting more and more money i think they can pull off some slightly better effects of that kind of stuff and yet they can't afford pyro anymore crazy that's really weird yeah (laughs) um with that said their uh profits were not as high as they would have liked recently so that's one of the reasons they've cut pyro among other things their reasoning is you just wouldn't notice it Mm. and Whilst I don't feel like it's necessary, it is kind of cool to see a pay-per-view or Raw or SmackDown start off with that bang, 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 and then all of the fireworks everywhere and a tech guy fall into his doom. You know, (laughs) pretty awesome to see that. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. Maybe a little bit of that would be awesome. I mean, I prefer someone playing that as a character rather than, oh, the character is me, just slightly more grumpy or slightly more obnoxious or Enzo where I am the same in the ring as I am out, which, oh God. Yeah, terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Saying that about the pyro, you really do feel it when Kane makes his entrance because a big part of Kane's entrance is when he slams his hands down and Mm. the pyro shoots up for more ring corners. That's pretty cool. And it kind of feels underwhelming when that doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, the don't get me wrong, Kane's entrance was still really cool. Well, the, uh, they dimmed the lights red, and they uh, he came up through the ring, and 
Robert Reigns. His acting and on mic skills are definitely not that great, but I will say he does some very good physical reactions, like his reaction when he just sees Kane coming through the floor definitely sold that moment, I think. Yeah, not to mention he did a very good uh, chokeslam reaction. Now, like, yeah. Kane in his prime could one-handed chokeslam people, and that was awesome. You know, he dived off the top rope with a flying clothesline. Uh, but now Kane is an older competitor, as are many of the Attitude Era wrestlers. So you really need someone who's able to give that Choke slam, a move which is supposed to be fierce, you know, grabbing someone by the throat, choking them, and then lifting them up by their throat and mm. slamming them down to the mat. You really want to have that good wham, that good slam reaction. Mm. Roman Reigns can deliver that. Indeed, a lot of people yeah. sort of just faintly fall to their feet, and it makes the move look underwhelming. Yeah, Roman Reigns is really good at selling moves like that, and that was also one of the few positives of the old Roman Undertaker feud. But yeah. That was all really good, although, like, again, it still seems really weird that everyone seems to keep referring to Kane as the Red Machine rather than the Demon. Like, the only reference to it is uh, one unintentionally hilarious commentator announcement, which was, like, the line itself was good, but it was just like a really unnatural pause. Sort of, and Roman Reigns is looking into the eyes of hell! He just <laughs> wanted to say the Demon Kane, but yeah. couldn't do that because that's uh, Finn Balor's character. Yeah. Sometimes on and off character. I guess I thought, uh, that's really all I wanted to say. It's just that real confusion because yeah, the sister has been Gale uh, reveal was not that great, but I th- think that's more due to marketing. I'm kind of be- amused by the idea that Bray Wyatt being a supernatural character is the main fault, and that needs to be gotten rid of. Which a lot of fans and wrestling critics seem to be subscribing to these days, and. Yeah, it's all well and good wanting to focus on the wrestling, but I think a little bit of that goes a long way and kind of elevates a good feud, I think. Well, I think part of the problem is that uh, WWE doesn't seem to know what to do with Bray Wyatt. He floats around from rivalry to rivalry without any meaningful development on his character. And Mm. for a guy who is so mysterious, we still don't know much about Bray Wyatt, except he has that hypnotising promo skill where he can say anything and he pretty much does just say nonsense sometimes <laughs> like it's great it's beautiful nonsense he gets across his point but it's nonsense so yeah. it's good that he can do that and he's so charming that what he says is very easy to listen to and very enticing but at the same time bro Wyatt hasn't really evolved since his nxc days if anything he's devolved he's lost the wyatt family who were his kind of enforcement his him spreading his word he doesn't seem to have any interest in acquiring acolytes or bringing anyone into his fold mm. um, he just seems to be floating around yeah it, i think it's part of kind of that thing of wanting to reduce it so it is just a one cult leader rather than a superpowered faction i mean i mean i guess we have the bludgeon brothers now that's uh <laughs> rowan harper bludgeon brothers for life <laughs> Uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where that goes, but I guess at least that's... That's, that's part of um, the Breezango stick, and that's uh, the Fashion Cops, which I might talk about a bit later when we talk about 205 Live. That's something I really like. So it's funny that the um, 2B, or the black part of the case, turned out to actually be the Bludgeon Brothers. Mm. It's kind of funny. I mean, yeah, I do enjoy characters like that that are sort of a big gimmick, so... Yeah, I'm kind of going around in circles here, but that's kind of what I like. I do like big, fancy characters like that, because at least it makes them easier to identify, and at least you can kind of sort of guess what their motive is half the time. Like, I will gladly take Bray Wyatt's spouting colourful cultish nonsense, even if I have no rhyme and reason, over Roman Reigns just going, I'm the big dog, and I'm going to fight you because I'm the big dog. Yeah. Uh, this is my yard, as he would like to say, which is yeah. just taken right out of the Undertaker. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think that was the entirety of their feud, whose yard it was. Yes. And it was funny that John Cena was the one to point out that, Roman Reigns, it's all good you fighting an old man who's on the edge of retirement, <laughs> like, but you've got to step up. Like, that doesn't mean anything. Like, yeah. The Undertaker's done some great things, but he is... Like, there's no way of getting around the fact that The Undertaker is an old man. Mm. And although he still has some time left with WWE, I think he's got something like two years, maybe even four years left on his contract. So we'll definitely see The Undertaker again. Yeah, I think he'll be more in a managerial role. Or at least, uh, who knows, maybe they'll bring some of the supernatural elements back. Although they do seem to 
kind of downplay the fact that, yeah, The Undertaker is this mysterious, scary wrestler. Like, Dolph Ziggler claimed that, oh, anyone can just walk into the ring and act like a zombie. But the thing is, The Undertaker doesn't act like a zombie. In the whole WWE continuity, he is a literal zombie to the point where, in kind of research for this, I did uh, what I suggested earlier and uh, looked at some of Undertaker stuff on YouTube. And... I saw the end of one Royal Rumble where The Undertaker was locked in a coffin and Cade and Paul Bearer set it on fire to show that The Undertaker was truly dead. Yeah. And then I clicked on the next video, The Undertaker's Resurrection, which I thought would be connected to this. But as it turns out, The Undertaker appears and it's Randy Orton that's terrified. And the commentator in that video went, Ah, oh, yes, yeah, so we last saw the Randy Orton and Sherlock the Undertaker in a coffin and set it on fire. And I was like, wait, this happened twice? <laughs> yeah, he has lost some uh, Buried Alive matches before as well and been buried and then seemingly come back from the dead. <laughs> Having said that, on TLC, we saw Braun Strowman put in a trash compactor, which Kane turned on. That should have killed Braun Strowman. I think one of them was saying he's trapped in there. No, he's dead. That's a trash <laughs> compactor. The size of that guy in that thing, there's nowhere to go. He's dead. Mm. Like, it would be cool if that was a supernatural element, but uh, given what happened with the ambulance match, I'm probably just going to say, oh, Braun Strowman's so strong, he just got out of that. No, I think the idea for Braun Strowman is he's just a freak of nature. He's just an unstoppable monster of yeah. like, men. And even then, like, it's a big over-the-top character, but at the very least, it's simple, it gets the point across, and you know what he's there to do. He's just a big monster who'll charge around and beat up whoever's near him. Yes, and that's what he needs to do. Like, nothing fancy. I mean, uh, Braun Strowman does more than he needs to do. He can do some chain wrestling, he can do some uh, dives, he doesn't need to do that, but he knows how to do it. Hmm. So he's really improved as a wrestler since he started out as the black sheep of the Wyatt family. Indeed. I just want to see big over-the-top characters, because I think that kind of definitely makes wrestling a bit stand out a bit more and a lot more entertaining. Otherwise, the only personalities you get are the arsehole ones, like Enzo Amore. Speaking of which, uh... 205 Live! What the hell is happening to 205 Live? <laughs> it came off a really successful Cruiserweight Classic tournament, and that was a success, definitely. Definitely went across really well. The fans loved it. You had such great competition there, and you signed a bunch of guys from that tournament... How is this not happening? It's become the new Divas division. And with the Divas division becoming the women's revolution, people are actually putting some stock into the women's matches. We had a couple uh, free women's matches on TLC. Two of them were pretty good. Mm. Uh, the unexpected one for me was Sasha Banks versus Alicia Fox. That was actually quite good on the pre-show, admittedly. They gave it some time, but uh, which I didn't expect as well. They had more than a couple of minutes on that match. That was pretty yeah. good. Like That was a good match. They also had... Emma versus Asuka. Very excited to see that. They made it more even than they should have done. As Asuka took a lot of offense rather yeah. than dealing it. They wanted to show her as a head-kicking machine. And the crowd were a little less infused after the match than they were at the start for Asuka's character because she took a lot of offense from Emma. Made Emma look good, but they haven't been making Emma look good. They even said before the match started, this is Emma's first pay-per-view match in WWE. Yeah, uh, they want to sell Asuka as like a female Goldberg, but they don't want to completely squash the other talents as well, so they're making it that, oh yeah, ever put up a fight at least. Yeah, a bit too much of a fight was a problem. Mm. It wasn't really the time to have an even match between the two, it was the time to have Asuka come out and just kick the crap out of Emma. That's what they wanted to see, they wanted mm. to see a bunch of high impact kicks and some cool offense, they made it too even. But having said that, the women's division has moved on. Unfortunately, Mickey James and Alexa Bliss seem to be lacking a bit of chemistry. They had a good match, but it wasn't as good as the other two matches before it. Mm. Yeah, part of the slight development from last time, which uh, you bring it up, Asuka, kind of reminded me of this. One of their biggest stars recently, Neville, has just flat out left. Oh, yeah. So Neville walked out of Raw. He was scheduled to lose in a non-title Lumberjack match to Enzo. And Neville apparently was very unhappy with this situation, left Raw before it began, causing him to change the match. Neville's now really happy. Apparently, he's really happy he left WWE. Yeah. As is Austin Aries. So these guys are just leaving the Cruiserweight division. Uh, the match was changed to Kalisto winning the title, only to lose it on TLC. But we kind of expected that. But it, it yeah. did do some good for Kalisto because it was Hispanic Heritage Month on WWE. And Kalisto also tributes uh, to Eddie Guerrero, 
as it was his birthday, it gave mm. him a bit of, it put him a bit over, which is good for him. And yeah. you know what? Masks sell well. Even Sin Cara can sell masks, and Sin Cara is doing terribly in <laughs> WWE. Uh, at least this iteration of Sin Cara, who was in 205 Live for a little while, and then they kicked him out again because of backstage fights. But yeah, the reason I brought that up is because whilst the uh, having to lose to Enzo was... Uh, it was but the reason why he walked out, but it was the last straw, because uh, Neville mentioned in interviews that he was... Um, well, there were two things that were frustrating. First off, a lot of the fees um, the wrestlers get were from royalties for some of their big matches. Yeah, this is true. And they cut out his match with Austin Aries out of the WrestleMania. Yeah, cut out from the WrestleMania DVD, the pre-show match. Largely because no one was in the audience. They didn't let the audience come in when the event started, the pre-show at least. So there's no one in the audience. And the match was pretty good. Like, there was a lot of cool stuff in there. Austin did a 450. It was an awesome match. But there were no people in attendance to watch that match, and nobody saw yeah. it. And on top of that, Neville was kind of sick of uh, the role he was given, which I have a horrible feeling there, maybe given to Asuka, which was that instead of being this like unstoppable menace, he was the guy that other people fought to get over, and he was getting really sick of that. Like He was getting views with people like Akira Tozawa, like Austin Aries, that were basically just designed for him to be the villain that everyone would fight to get over, and he would just sort of begrudgingly get the title back eventually. Yeah, I mean, I can understand that he was in a position where he just had to act like a kind of robotic character, where he didn't really have much motivation going on. I liked his, I liked how his accent was working. That was pretty cool. Yeah, like he, like all credits due to Neville, like he was really good at selling himself as this egotistical brute who would continuously bully someone until he got the championship. But I can understand that if that is all you have to do, and it's not for your character, but to uh, only to sell the appeal of other characters, then yeah, I can kind of get why you would be sick of it, especially when you had to do it for an entire year. Well, you know what, though? Uh, Neville's not the only one that walked out. I mean, this is outside of the Cruiserweight division, but Nia Jax walked out of Raw as well. Mm. Uh, all kinds of stories going on about that. Allegedly, she wanted time off. Mm. Uh, another story is that she wasn't happy with creative losing to Sasha Banks at the pay-per-view. Allegedly, they granted her the time off because she wasn't in any major storylines. People are saying she wanted more money, and she phoned The Rock on advice about what to do, and he said to walk out. And mm. if anything, they're saying that uh, she has some sway to get back and perhaps get that uh, dollar, you know, because she's The Rock's uh, real-life cousin. That mm. I would imagine... Not so much. They're not really a fan of people reacting like this. They don't want to give in to demands. Um, maybe she is just having time off and the internet's gone crazy. Uh, I know for a fact, Neville, when he walked out, WWE has definitely gone out of their way to kind of remove him from the program. He's out of the yeah. entrance for 205 Live now. Yeah. He's been cut out of that. Yeah, they've literally cut him out. No one's even mentioned him. Like, Enzo doesn't even mention him in the list of people he's been defeated. So that's yeah, how... Uh... Um, from what I understand, on live events, Enzo was saying that he had retired Neville. And mm. he's quickly stopped doing that, though. So whatever WWE's plan was to do about that situation, they've just dropped it and they'll ignore it. So, yeah, it's already bad when, one of, let's face it, one of your biggest stars who helped carry the division for so long has just walked out because... He was basically just being sold as a way to get Enzo over, because even though that Enzo, let's face it, he's not the greatest wrestler. Great talker, well, not a great wrestler. One of the problems with 205 Live is that the creative talent there are stuck in 205 Live. They don't get more than one spot on a pay-per-view, if any. They mm. don't really get to be at the forefront of live events, because there'll only be like one 205 Live match at a live event. And therefore, they're not getting paid as much, so they're getting less money. I know some of the wrestlers like Jack Gallagher have had uh, indie bookings since. The wrestlers are allowed to take other bookings. It's just, for the most part, really expensive. Like, mm. You could hire John Cena, and John Cena has done things like guest appearances outside of WWE, but generally they pay him a ton of money to do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just kind of baffling of what they wanted to do, because, yeah, they let Callisto beat Enzo Amore for Eddie Guerrero's birthday, and it was all really exciting, and then Enzo just beats him at tables, ladders, and chairs, and now there's, like, a sort of tag team going on between, um... Oh, I really wish I could remember the other name. Aria Davari. That's him. 
Uh, he is on Enzo's side for some reason, and it's Mustafa Ali who is uh, working with Callisto, which admittedly, Mustafa Ali and Callisto I actually really like as a tag team pair because they do yeah. work well together. You know what? I really like Callisto. He's got a lot of potential. They're trying to sell him, though, as a second-rate Rey Mysterio, and yeah. that's the problem. But, I mean, the crowd is so not invested in 205 Live. So on this match... Kalisto does this huge outside dive. He fist bumps a kid wearing a luchador mask and starts chanting the lucha, lucha, lucha chants. Crowd are dead silent. Yeah. Like this is the new Divas division. Like like this is a concession break, you know, rather than a match. Like, yeah. What else can you do? That's the big spot. That's the outside dive. And if no one's saying anything, what are you supposed to do? I don't. I don't understand. I was watching another one where everyone did an outside dive, and then you've got Grand Matalik and stuff doing these outside moonsaults, and it's crazy. And the crowd just don't care. They don't care yeah. about the most athletic moves they can do. They've been using AJ Styles on dark matches after SmackDown ends to stop the crowd walking out before 205 Live starts. Yeah, I should explain for context that um, the 205 Live is uh, filmed after a SmackDown show. So the SmackDown's two hours, and then if you're in the audience, you stay another hour to watch the film of the 205 Live. So the argument is that well, the crowd is tired after SmackDown, but... Um, well, the wrestlers are tired. I don't know why they don't film it after Raw, because the yeah. cruiserweights are on Raw. So why the hell are they making them appear on SmackDown as well? Mm. And I know that the talent allegedly all gets there on Sunday and they have to sit through everything, but sometimes they split up the brands for different tours like mm. they did in the case of SmackDown and Raw with AJ Styles having to come over from the overseas tour. But mm. man, like it would be so much kinder for those wrestlers to not have to do that extra night. Yeah, and it would be just nicer to, yeah, have a, or maybe just film on the same night as NXT, so that, you know, you have at least a crowd that's willing to be a bit more engaged with it. Well, I would go as far as to say that 205 Live should be filmed in Full Sail University for NXT, mm. uh, because smaller crowd is more intimate, they loved the Cruiserweight Classic matches, they got a great reaction, it sells the show better. And yeah, because of that, they have it's pre-taped. They have more time to work on the matches, so it's not just something, something headlock, something, something outside dive headlock. Yeah, I mean, even in something like Progress, it's just a very uh, small show. But from the clips I've seen of it, the crowd is very intimate in that. That it is really getting into it. You can just sort of feel the energy through it. Admittedly, they sometimes get a bit too invested in it. As um, I watched a clip of one heel turn of. Um, uh, of a guy named Strangler uh, Davis, and the entire crowd pretty much erupted into "fuck you, Davis, <laughs> fuck you, Davis." Which, uh... You know, speaking about the wrestler names, I love Strangler Davis. Yeah, <laughs> I wonder what this guy does. I wonder <laughs> what kind of moves this guy uses. Strangler Davis. <laughs> um, uh. They need to work on some of their character interactions as well in 205 Live because a lot of characters, especially the people in Enzo's current crew, uh, are dropping to the sidelines. When I mean, mm. you've got, um, I forget his name, the PowerPoint guy. Oh, Drew Gulak. Yeah, Drew Gulak. Uh, he's changed his character. That's really cool. He's changed his music as well. And on that subject, Kalisto's got new music, and I much preferred his old music, mm. the kind of uh, techno style stuff. And now he's got the, uh, I mean, they've got the crowd chant. In with the new music, which is actually his Lucha Dragons music, but mm. I preferred his new music, but he's gone back to that. Whatever. But so Drew Gulak's got a bit of a character coming across with his PowerPoint presentation. Uh, got a tweet from Microsoft. That was really funny. That's all good stuff. Yeah. But other characters have been dropped to the sidelines, like Noam Dar, the Scottish supernova. There's nothing happening with him since uh, he dumped Alicia Fox. Mm. And like, I thought that was a really good angle. That got some of the uh, women wrestlers into 205 Live when they brought Sasha Banks in for a little bit. I don't know why they dropped that. It was quite entertaining. I know some of the fans weren't too hot on Alicia Fox being on 205 Live, but it's good for Noam Dar because they got him some exposure. And they got him some yeah. time with Raw as well. And now what's he doing? Nothing. Mm. Yeah, like, like I mentioned last time, I'm struggling to think of all the charismatic characters. Like, you have Jack Gaha, who is now turned full heel. You have Brian Kendrick. And I think that's it. I was trying to uh, look back through the highlights to find any notable feuds, and it's there's really nothing. The only feud that kind of amused me, because it just kind of summed up so many other feuds, is that there's one where TJ Perkins and, um, or TJ, the TJP, as we have to call him uh, now. It's uh, TJP now. Rebranded, because you can copyright that. 
Yeah. TJP and Rich Swan and the premise of Hatfield was that uh, TJP was going, oh man, we have this really excellent chemistry. Like, I know we don't have tag teams, but wouldn't it be great if we just, uh, who knows what kind of matches we can make? And uh, Rich Swan was just going, Look, dude, I want to fight other people. I've seen... <laughs> like, well, unfortunately, the roster is not that big. Yeah. <laughs> I fight more people. Uh, like, he was trying to say, look, I there's this guy with the, the Fly Del Rio that, that guy's cool, I just want to have one fight with him. And then TJP, as part of his suit, just beats him up backstage and goes, no, you're going to fight me now! <laughs> Which, uh, uh, yeah, Lince Dorado, nothing happening with that guy either. Yeah. Then mention it, yeah. Like, barely anything's happening with the Lucha Doors, I Ralph think. Ralph Mastelik was one of the standout competitors from the Cruiserweight Classic. The runner-up, in fact. And there's been nothing done with him. That yeah. guy is insanely talented. Yeah, it's really... Maybe sad, like, I was going to say, the Lucha Doors in particular, like, are just across WWE, I wouldn't be able to tell you what the personality of fight style of any of these Lucha Doors were, apart from Lucha Door. Yeah, it just hasn't been working out for the uh, Mexican wrestlers in WWE for some reason. Mm. Like, Sin Cara, he's having some television time now. He's actually beaten Baron Corbin twice in a row, who's the United States champion. So I think mm. he should have a U.S. title shot. Oh, yeah. sorry, I'm not supposed to say U.S. title. United States championship. Yeah. Okay, we good? Mm-hmm. We good? We can continue? Please put the gun down, sir. <laughs> sir? <laughs> sir? <laughs> Yeah, I'd probably be more excited with Sin Cara versus The Miz than Baron Corbin versus The Miz. Yeah, Baron Corbin has one of those big guy fighting styles where he he throws you around, uh, but he doesn't do a lot of movement. I know he has that thing where he moves out of the ring and then he runs around the side and comes back in, um, Mm. but he doesn't do anything spectacularly interesting in the ring. He shouldn't do because he's a heel. With The Miz, The Miz doesn't do any flashy moves because he's a heel. That's why The Miz can slay on the mic, but when it comes to the ring, he's putting over the other guy. That's why often he has to get people like the Mr. Arthur joining, or Braun Strowman, or Kane. Couldn't believe his luck when that happened, I break you bet. <laughs> yeah, and I struggle to understand how he contacted Kane in the first place. Did he sort <laughs> of, like, look under the ring, see hell, and sort of throw a message in a bottle? Because <laughs> how do you contact the demon, the big red machine? How do you get? Has he got a cell phone? I mean, I understand he's running for mayor or somewhere in his alter ego, but what's going on with him here? I'd actually love if Kane just entered through the ring just completely coincidentally, and then the mayor just went, oh! Oh, and he's on my team now. What? Oh, okay, sure. Why not? <laughs> what, <laughs> what, <am I> <laughs> <fighting>? <laughs> well, happy coincidence. I just happen to be here. <laughs> it's been months I've been under that ring waiting for the perfect time. <laughs> and it just happened to come. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of a thing that two or five lives seems to have fallen this way. I mean, the fact that uh, we went from everyone hating Enzo to the point of beating him up to... Uh, say, oh, Drew Gulak and these heels now just suddenly like him and are forming an alliance because why not? Yeah, allegedly Enzo is supposed to be paying off these guys. The same people that beat him down like two weeks prior. Mm. It's ridiculous. But nevertheless, we're supposed to believe Enzo's got deep pockets and he's paying these guys to work with him. And to their credit, at least they're on TV. Yeah. It's just this really baffling thing, because I mentioned last time on the podcast that I was just completely baffled by what they were doing, and I'm still baffled now, because Enzo, like, yeah, he's a really good talker. The problem is, I think he's now just played an incredibly weak-ass version of Neville, because he, Neville, yeah, he was stuck in one character, but at least he was altering his dialogue to actually uh, match the people he was talking to. And so he's just saying the same goddamn thing over and over again. I'm a star, you're all nobody. I will now insult someone who is not related to this match just because I think I can make a cheap joke. You know, it's a, it's the same damn thing every time. And I know that they're going to drag it out because, yeah, like you said, they prefer to have the chase rather than the catch for whatever reason. Yeah. Well, at the very least, they're allowing Enzo to do more stuff in the ring. Not that they were probably restricting him earlier. They wanted him to look very weak against Neville. But now he's fighting a guy the same size as himself. He's doing more actual, let's call it wrestling, loosely. <laughs> um, which is a shame because Kalisto could do some insane stuff, but probably can't do that against Enzo. Enzo, I love you on the mic, man. You're great. But you're wrestling. Uh, bring it up a bit. Yeah, I mean, it would be probably pretty cool if he was... Uh... I, it makes it sound really bad, but I can't remember his name. But I really wish he was just a manager for one of the heels. Like Ari Devari is a perfect fit. He's yeah, uh, that's, he's got that's the a guy load of money. For, yeah, 
He's supposed to come from um, privilege. He's supposed to be a fashionable guy. And admittedly, when I look at Enzo, I can't figure out if anything he wears goes together. But that's <laughs> supposed to be fashion. So he's supposed to be in that. Yeah, so it makes sense that the two of them would tag team, but I would actually like to have like a cruiserweight version of Paul or Heyman and Brock Lesnar, just have Enzo continuously bigging the guy up against Kalisto. That would actually be kind of cool, but no, they're basically pushing Enzo front and center, and they're trying to make Kalisto this uh, charismatic face, but the problem is... Yeah, like I said, the crowd's not really into it, and he's not 100% sure what his character is either, apart from, I'm a generic good guy luchador. And to be fair, I'm not saying that Enzo is garbage in the ring. I'm no. saying that the Cruiserweights have a very technical style, and he's mm. just definitely bringing a regular WWE style to the ring. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's never really not bad, but it's the best way I can describe it, it's like, it's like bringing a boxer in the middle of, say, a Jackie Chan movie. Like, boxing is cool and everything, but that's not what you're there to see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember the movie that I saw that in, actually. It was really good. Hmm. I think Fearless had a scene like that. But anyway, we're getting off topic. We are indeed. Uh, so, yeah, just... I think I'll have to agree with the statement at the beginning. What the hell is going on with the Cruiserweight division? <laughs> there were some little gems that happened in the Cruiserweight division. Mm. One advantage of it being filmed uh, just after SmackDown is at one time, Bruce Ango showed up and uh, had a little interaction with Drew Gulak, which was really funny. Oh, yeah, that was cool. And uh, that's probably the sort of thing they need to do. They need mm. to have more main roster talent come in unexpectedly, shoot up the ratings, shoot up the YouTube views for 205 Live, get interest into it. Because currently, they're looking to do a UK show, and they're probably looking at the shows they have and something's on the chopping block. And to my knowledge, they can't get rid of main event because that's, uh, that's got broadcast ties with Sky. That's mm -hmm. the reason it got taken off the WWE Network, which is a shame because that show is doing well and now it's pretty bad. But they've got to be looking for where can we save money somewhere. Well, we've got this cruiserweight division that nobody watches. Yeah. And this might be why they were so withdrawn on hiring all of the women from the Mae Young Classic. Because I felt like there were a ton of competitors that I would like to see in WWE. But I think they were very selective. Yeah, I can understand that. They can de easily use the logic like, well, the Cruiserweight Classic, but it didn't work when we brought everyone here. So maybe just like take Kyrie Sen and maybe no one else, really. Yeah, so I remember the crowd chanting, uh, please sign Jazzy for Jazzy Gabbard, uh, the mm. alpha female, as she calls herself. And Triple H came out and said, hey, you guys cost me a lot of money with Cedric Alexander. And then that was that was what he said. Because oh, Cedric Alexander is fantastic, but he probably mm. hasn't made that money back. Not in 205 Live at the very least. It's one of those unfortunate things where I think the producers will see, well, yeah, make that logic. You guys cost me a lot with Cedric Alexander, but uh, it's kind of missing the counter argument of, yeah, but you put him on a network show, which you film after another show in which the crowd is dead and no one, there's no energy in the, well, there's plenty of, athletic action in the ring but there's no energy in the matches and people don't feel the need to engage with it yeah and you have to imagine with the people leaving the cruiserweight division and being incredibly happy about it austin aries and neville you have to imagine the roster isn't that happy like yeah they're, they're not on the dvds they're not on the live events most of them aren't on raw and they have to be there for the whole time yeah it's one of those things where I think like, they're trying to uh, bring like a one or two matches in raw to drum up interest, but it's very clear that they don't know what to do with the roster, and they're trying to give them good athletic action and do their jobs, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they weren't happy with it, because they're getting almost no exposure at all. I mean, if it's not telling that WWE is losing enthusiasm, they stop putting out the Cruiserweight mat and the purple ropes for the ring when they mm. do the cruiserweight matches on raw so they can't even be bothered to make the presentation to sell the products like how do they feel about it also correct me have they um, completely dropped the the most exciting hour on television tagline as well or i wouldn't know if they've dropped that because sometimes i phase out from the commentary because it's very samey because that is fair enough tom phillips sounds the same as vic joseph vic joseph sounds the same as michael cole i remember when Tom Phillips couldn't make a SmackDown a couple of weeks back, and Michael Cole was filling in. I couldn't tell the difference. I mean, really, the only person that stands out for the wrong reasons is Booker T, and that's because, bless you, Booker T, you're a sort of great wrestler and personality, but he has a tendency to just say random nonsensical <laughs> things during the fight. 
Booker T is fantastic. I'm especially liking his arguments with Corey Graves that sound real. <laughs> <laughs> and him calling Corey Graves a fan, which is amazing. Uh, Booker T is a legend. I really appreciate him. And you know what? I really like Booker T on commentary because if it wasn't Booker T, would have David Otonga. Yeah, any back to the topic. I mean, it's just, it's kind of like Impact Wrestling. It's really sad that 205 Live had, had such a great idea and all the performers are so energetic, but it's not working. Uh, having the guests on, putting Enzo Amore on the main roster, it feels like this should be like re-energizing the show, but at the moment it feels like those uh, last few jolts of electricity you're giving to try and start its heart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if 205 Live is on live support, then it might be time to pull the plug and reintroduce the wrestlers freely onto the main roster. Yeah. We could have this title on the main roster as something that other guys can compete for. I mean, there are guys on the main roster who are inside the weight limit. Finn Balor, under 205. But you're never going to see Finn Balor on 205 Live because if he was there, he would be locked on 205 Live and that's considered to be the worst place your career can be right now if you're a WWE wrestler. Yeah. Like I said, the pro- my initial problem with Enzo is that they were all basically treated it like um, he was being sent to 205 Live because that's a punishment if no one can stand you. But yeah, it would be cool to just have them on the main roster competing for that title. Or maybe you have like a second, I don't know, Oh, what you could call it. The lightweight title. No, that sounds really bad. The light wanna... heavyweight title, perhaps, which is what <laughs> the uh, cruiserweight title was called in WWF before they got their hands on WCW and merged yeah. it with the cruiserweight title. Or maybe something like the, I don't uh, no, the high flyer cha- belt, whatever. It, it's, <laughs> the uh, high flyer belt. You yeah. must be able to jump this high to get this belt. <laughs> I don't know, but basically some kind of alternate belt you can have like on SmackDown and Raw, and then you can sort of split up the roster that way. I tell you what would be cool. It's if they did get their hands on Impact Wrestling, if they had the X Division Championship. Oh, yeah, that would be cool. Something like that. One of those titles that's defended with people that don't really fit in any other divisions, but it was high-velocity action, similar to the Cruiserweight division. But then occasionally you had people like Samoa Joe make their way into it, saying, ah, it's not about weight limits, it's about no limits. I remember very much the only disappointing Ultimate X match, which is a match where they would have an X drawn from ropes at the very top of the ring, something like (laughs) 10, 15 feet up, where the title hanged from. Jeff Hardy went out, because he was in one of his matches, got a ladder, and then propped it up and started climbing it, because Jeff Hardy knows how to do a ladder match. He doesn't know how to climb the ropes in an Ultimate X match. And that was kind of offensive to the concept. Yeah. <laughs> and the crowd was telling us, look how smart Jeff is. Well, Jeff's just lazy. He knows how to do a ladder match. Oh, uh, yeah, that does seem like a bit of a downer. But yeah, something like that would be cool. I think it's probably better than... Um, I know they want something on the network, but I think what they're doing now, it's just... It's really just underselling the performers, if nothing else. Yeah, I mean, there's plans to do a UK show at some point. This filmed in the UK with Nigel McGillis on commentary with JR. Hmm. But if that's going to be received in the same way as 205 Live, there's no point in doing it. Uh, well, actually, if they're filmed in the UK, there's a chance that if you'll have a crowd that comes specifically to see that show and get more invested in it. Because I think another part of the problem we're linking it to SmackDown is that you have a crowd that's come specifically to see SmackDown and see all the wrestlers on that roster. And by the time they get to 205 Live, they've been there for over two hours. There's a bunch of guys they don't really know, apart from maybe Enzo and Kalisto, and they just can't be bothered. I mean, if they did film it in the UK, you get a lot of really rowdy UK fans. Oh, God, yeah. Especially if you want to compare it to overseas audiences like in japan it's more customary to be silent and respectful and watch uh, quietly so you don't often see the crowd going nuts you especially wouldn't see the audience in japan trying to take over the show with cm punk chants and things like that mm. meanwhile over on progress you have uh, the fans continuously making uh some rude chants like i already mentioned the fuck you davis chant but that's actually one of the light ones um the c yeah. word has been thrown around multiple times uh there was one time when this sort of uh, mid-card wrestler, I forget his name, but uh, he uh, got so into his match that um, his face started coming out in a flush and they were just continuously chanting, uh, let's just call him uh, Davey, just for a second. They were chanting, Davey's got a red face! Davey's got a red face! Throughout the entire chant. <laughs> to the point where this poor wrestler just in the middle of the ring just suddenly turned around to the crowd and went, I can't help it! <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, what a breakage of character. Um, 
Well, if the crowd are being vulgar, and it happens sometimes, um, to quote Triple H, that's bad for business. Because you're doing a PG show, especially in WWE, and you want everyone to watch it. And if yeah. you can't have them watch it with the sound on, you can't have them watch it. Yeah, I think it might be admittedly because progress does slightly encourage that. But yeah, it'll be uh, interesting to see how... I mean, they did actually film some of the 205 Live stuff in the UK. Because I remember there was uh, that one match Austin in Aries had with Jack Gallagher and Neville. Because um, Jack Gallagher was trying to uh, introduce the custom of a toast to... um, Austin Aries and then Neville invaded. Although, admittedly, they did have to edit certain chants out because apparently at one point the crowd are chanting Neville is a wanker and they had to kind of yeah. turn that out of the YouTube clip. <laughs> if I remember correctly, in the UK Championship show, JR asked Nigel McGuinness, what does a wanker mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's probably best that it's, it's not brought over to WWE. Yeah. But... Don't worry about it. Let's tell all the kids what it's meant by it. You see, kids... When a daddy cannot find a mummy, they... <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Moving swiftly on. Point is, um, 2 or 5 Live, we really like your performers and we really want you to do well, but it's kind of painfully obvious that they don't know what to do of you right now. It just needs an uh, infusion of enthusiasm, a little energy to it. Like, the crowd I kind of condition themselves not to care about it, and that's a problem. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's... I think that's actually a good way of putting it because as well as enthusiasm for the crowd, it's also enthusiasm from creative that they actually need to really care about this show and actually work on making it something important rather than just go applying the Enzo Amore Saint plasters on it and hoping that will uh, fix things. Yeah, and this is a problem, I mean, with Asuka and her wrestling style, when she's moved up to the main roster, has become a bit tamer when they ha- she had a match against Emma, and a second match against Emma, it's the same with the Cruiserweights. We know that they have this high-impact offense. We've not seen what we've seen from the Cruiserweight Classic. We've seen a lot slower offense on the main show. And maybe it's time to cut loose and let them go crazy. Yeah. I mean, I know these moves are dangerous. Like, there's a reason The Miz has never been injured. Like, there's a reason the Miz is still wrestling right now, and he's a fantastic worker. Because he doesn't jump from the top rope all the time. Because that's mm. bad for your health. You're going to get hurt if you do those kind of moves. I don't know how Dean Ambrose is still going. That guy jumps around all the time, throws and drops <laughs> things. Like, and he wrestles, I think he wrestled more live matches than anyone else last year. Or oh, wow. something like that. He's got paid a lot of money for it, but he's putting his body through hell. And Booker mm. T, who we spoke of earlier, um, said that, Enjoy with Dean Ambrose now, because he's not going to be around forever. <laughs> like, that wrestling style, the man's not going to last. And Booker T knows, because he cut Missile Dropkick out of his finishing move when he moved from WCW to WWE. Mm. Yeah, so I'm not sure what it would be, whether it's just like letting them cut loose and be more exciting, whether it's like building up the actual storyline and characters, I know. It's just... It's definitely something that's going to take a long-term commitment and, like you said, enthusiasm about it. And I, WWE, I don't think they're thinking long-term. I think they're just thinking, okay, we'll do this short-term fix and if that doesn't work, we can just pull the plug, which I don't think is a good attitude to have. No, I mean, it doesn't help that there's so much WWE. You can't be enthusiastic about all of it. Mm. When I'm trying to watch all of it, most of the time, it's so long and drawn out. I'm probably editing a video while I'm watching it. I'm watching it in the background and doing something else. I mean, there's a reason why I haven't committed to actually watch the show rather than the YouTube highlights, because just keeping up with the YouTube highlights feels like a lot of work. Like, let's see. Okay, these are so many matches. I think that's a storyline segment. Okay, which one am I actually more interested in? Uh, This one sounds okay. Yeah, if I had to actually sort of find time to sit down and watch these shows, I don't think I would make it. Oh, yeah, Jonan, definitely it's a chore. I mean, I'm struggling with it. And I'm trying to find other things to do while I'm doing it. Like, I'm editing a pickup video or something like that at the same time. Mm. But it is a chore. There's a lot of WWE television programming on. Maybe they could do a cutting it down. I don't know why Raw is three hours. That's, <laughs> that's a long show. Well, you need to see a lot of big guys like Kane squash the small guys. Cause, or having the big, muscly guys go up against each other. Because that's what Vince likes. That's yeah. That's what Vince likes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there are other ways of running wrestling shows speaking of which Lucha Underground and it's uh, final season finale Ultima Lucha Trez yes I'm finally caught up with Lucha Underground really great stuff going on there although uh, allegedly still no deal for the next season 
Yeah, we'll get into that in a moment. But yeah, I should probably explain for uh, wrestling fans who tuned in and have not seen uh, Lucha Underground, or anyone who's just tuned in and have not heard of it. Basically, Lucha Underground, it's not... Um, it has a different structure from most other wrestling shows. It's not done weekly, continuously, like WWE is. What it does is it tends to be structured more like a TV show, as in it has a season... That builds up to this four-episode finale called Ultima Lucha, which kind of serves as, I guess it would be, in any other wrestling show, this would be the big pay-per-view, like your WrestleManias. This is where most of the storylines are building up to, except here, it's definitive because, like I said, it's the season finale, it has that TV show mentality, so you can not only expect certain long-running feuds to actually come to an end, but also some plot twists to be dropped in order to try and hook you in for the next season. Yeah, it's really great that it's filmed as a television show, because it means that they can really control what they present, and the backstage sections look fantastic, because they're filmed very artistically. The only problem with this is it's really bad for the talent, who are locked in TV deals and can't appear on other promotions while that's going on, so they can't make more money. So they film a bunch of shows... And then they're stuck not being able to be on TV. Maybe there may be an exception with AAA Wrestling because AAA Wrestling and Lucha Underground work together. One notable thing is uh, Ricochet, a.k.a. Prince Puma, has been looking to get out of his Lucha Underground contract for quite a while. And he may have, we'll probably get into this later, may have been written off for good. And notably, he has a lot of contract time before he can go back to wrestling and other promotions on television. He in fact tweeted uh, a picture of a ticking clock. And... I can't remember what he said with this tweet, but something like, time's ticking down. He'll be free of his Lucha Underground contract soon. People like Taya Valkyrie and Johnny Mundo, or Johnny Wrestling, or Johnny Impact, whatever the hell he's called. Yeah, um, Johnny Mundo, a.k.a. Johnny Impact, a.k.a. Johnny Nitro, a.k.a. Johnny Blaze. Um, they, yeah. Um, yeah, so far they've managed to arrange deals where... They've taken on, the sl- uh, they're able to go on the Indies by having a slightly different variation of their name on Lucha Underground. Like, Willie Mac is known as The Mac on Lucha Underground. Uh, oh, I forget his name in the Indies, but I think it's something like Shane in the Indies where it's, it's just kill shot here. So, yeah, basically what, what I'm getting at is a lot of wrestlers go by alternate names in order to uh, go in the indie scenes. But yeah, there have been rumours that these stars have been breaking their contracts deliberately to try and get word from the um, managers. Yeah, I mean, another reason why they will change their names is for, because of merchandise and things like that and owning of the characters, especially in WWE. Uh, we talked about it with TJP and a lot of the other characters that they want that name and they want to use it on their products, and they want to use it on action figures. They don't want anyone disputing that, which is why they have a problem with the Broken Harley's gimmick that uh, Impact Wrestling seems to own, and things like that. Yeah, but Ultima Lucha Trez, we will get into the uh, details later, just because uh, it could get very unfortunate, uh, specifically with a lot of friends coming up. But yeah, there were a lot of great matches. As I mentioned in the last podcast, where I mentioned that when we recorded that, the first week of Ultima Lucha was starting, and it ended with the match between Killshot and Dante Fox, or as they call it, the Hell of War match. Oh man, some of the spots in that match. I mean, can you go any further than throwing a guy from the top, it must have been 20 foot, mm. through glass, through tables? Yeah. And like, that's what I'm talking about when it's not ballet. There's no faking that. Mm. He fell that far through those things. Yeah. That's and... insane. Yeah, and you could see the scars on their backs as well. So, yeah, that was a really, really great match. Like, admittedly, the one criticism I do have with the Ultima Lucha Trez is, remember when I said it's that um, the bleeding made sense in this because it was meant to be the end of a long, literally bloody feud? And yes. It was meant to be a big emotional end. And that it would be silly if there was bleeding in every single match. They kind of went a bit overboard this time. Another problem I think they had is with the bad guys trying to rip the masks of fellow competitors to try to disgrace them. And that's very, very bad for the heritage of those wrestlers. They were doing that every other match. Anyone that was wearing a mask, someone was trying to rip their masks off. Even wrestlers with masks were doing it to other wrestlers. You just couldn't do that. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I That's mean, saying, it, this is fine. I'm okay with you doing this to me. I don't care about the masks that I'm wearing. 
Yeah, it's just really weird. I mean, it made sense with Marty and Phoenix because uh, they were. Um, he was um, going for that angle of, oh, I bet Melissa Santos will hate you if he sees if she sees what you look like under. Well, that another mask. thing is like Marty's sister wears a mask. Yeah, and she's part of the Moth Tribe and she's a masked wrestler. Yeah. So what's going on there? And what's up with Mary Porsa in the end turning on Marty the Moth? Well, yeah, I think what the implication, like, it Which, happened really Maybe quick. he lost and she was just mad that she embarrassed her. No, 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 no. it wasn't that, because um, it was cut very quickly, so it took me a while to go back as well. But there was a moment where Phoenix was doing a suicide dive, and Marty pushed Murray Pulsar in front of him so that she right. would take the suicide okay. dive. I thought it was linking back, because at one point they were enemies. Yeah. And then they just patched it up. For no reason. It was this thing, because their relationship is one of the uh, more confusing bits that wasn't implemented well enough, because initially she was trying to strengthen Marty so that he wouldn't be so obsessed with childish impulses like going after Melissa Santos, the uh, announcer. And I will say, Melissa Santos as well, uh, very great in this season. I mean, she's normally a very good announcer, and she puts a lot into the announcing, which is something a lot of announcers I don't really believe tend to do. They just sort of say the lines, but she can get, she's really trying to put it across, and a different character for each person, the way she says it differently. Yeah. And she's ranked her one of the best things about the show. She's the first thing you see before you see the wrestlers. She did try and do a bit of wrestling when they did uh, a match between uh, the Moth Tribe and Phoenix and Melissa Santos. She probably shouldn't have done that. She looked great, but not in the ring. Yeah. Like, you know, I, stick I, to what you do. I kind of like the idea of that match and I kind of appreciate it okay she looks green that's fair enough she's just had like a some small training from Phoenix they've even implied that she's not a wrestler she just showed up it was when they kind of she suddenly forgot how to do all the wrestling when Marty was just chasing her around the ring I yeah, thought I mean, oh okay why did you I'll, do this? I'll give her credit she's better than Eva Marie she's better than Lana you know uh, that, that's me saying you're better than the trash on the ground but I'm not saying she I'm not saying she was bad <laughs> I'm not saying she was terrible. I'm saying that for the high level of um, wrestling we're used to in Lucha Underground. Yeah, like I did like the fact that she got involved in the pin that, that finally uh, took out Marty. But yeah, it yeah. was one of those things that originally Marty Pulsa was trying to strengthen Marty away from these things. Then she supported him and uh, did things like interfere with Phoenix's matches. And then they did this thing where Marty shoved her in front of a suicide dive. She got furious and stormed off and then turned on him at the last minute in a mask versus hair match. Yes. And to be honest, uh, Marty's just going to look more terrifying without his hair. Yeah. He looked like that uh, French team did in uh, NXT when uh, that guy got his hair cut and suddenly decided, I've got my hair cut, I'm a monster. And you look exactly like you did before, but with your hair cut. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there was this dance, I think they were called, or something along those lines. I'll have to ask Sven the Crusader, he'll translate the French for <laughs> <laughs> uh, Because of Strahd joke for anyone who's not seen that. But yeah, <laughs> that's been a bit weird. I mean, if it does become a feud in the next season, that'll be an, at least an intriguing angle, because at the very least, like, Mari Pulsar's been very slowly getting better. I would say that she's had some better matches, but it would be interesting. She's not really gone over yet, so that'll be interesting. But Well, maybe being a babyface will work, because she's not really scary. Mm. <laughs> she's supposed to be one of those Harley Quinn-type characters, with yeah. maybe the haircut and acting a bit unchained or tilted with the personality. But it doesn't come across, yeah. because she's... With a mask, and the mask is great, but you can't see the face, so you don't really get the expressions coming across. Character is very confusing. We've said this before. She's supposed to be scary, but she's dressed like she's wearing a Halloween costume. Mm. It doesn't really come across as well as it should do. Maybe being, maybe being a baby face will work. So yeah. that she can come down, beat someone up. I mean, we had, um, we had Black Lotus apparently become a baby face. She yeah, showed up. But- I thought she was gone. We'll be getting into that, but yeah, it's really weird because they had like the uh, going straight for the mask in several Marty's matches, and yeah, you know, Phoenix bled again here, but it kind of made sense because oh, that's kind of Marty's tactic. But then Sexy Star versus Tyre both were bleeding, and and an evil Lee's bled out in uh, her match against Katrina. Oh, and sorry, just going back to one match before Tyre and a uh, Sexy Star that. Just see the feel on that one because, admittedly, 
after the whole sexy star controversy, it's been a bit hard for me to get into our matches, especially when they try and sell as a baby face, but... Yeah, I mean, we're very likely not to see sexy star for the next season. Mm. Which would be awkward because they... When, when they were writing her out, they continued that spider tribe thing, which we hadn't had any resolution on, really. Yeah, I was thinking they'd forgotten it until then, but yeah, it seemed to be a bit weird, like, okay, Sexy Star, she was the Lucha Underground Champion for one week, and then Jolly Mundo stole her title, and then she and Mac were desperately trying to get it back with no success, and they decided that the ultimate Lucha match would have her be against Taya who, yes, did interfere on several occasions, but it's not really dealing with the main problem. It's like saying, right, the Joker has completely ruined my life, so I'm going to focus on beating up Bob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, I'm not sure what they're going to do with Sexy Star afterwards. It's a TV show. Maybe they'll recast Sexy Star. I mean, Kane changed uh, wrestler at one point, mm. And, you know, they had uh, The Outsiders... Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, they recast them in WWE at one point for like a couple of weeks. Kane was actually the fake Diesel, Kevin Nash. Yeah. That didn't work out at all. Everyone hated that. <laughs> yeah. It's either that or they could do what they did of El Dragon Azteca, which is have someone else pick up the mask and become Sexy Star Jr. <laughs> that would be amazing, actually. Mm. It might be one way to get around it, but yeah, the bleeding got kind of ridiculous. Yeah, there were some matches that deserved it, like the um, the triple threat match, when, okay, yeah, it's three villains, so that's probably going to happen, but yeah, it did feel kind of ridiculous that we had so much of it in a row, and in fact, after the Yellow War match, the match that had the most impact for me, where I thought, oh god, was the cage match between Matanzo and El Dragon Azteca Jr., and... That wasn't a match that had any blood whatsoever, but Matanza was just throwing... Uh, for those who don't know, Matanza is meant to be this demigod monster, and he was mainly being undefeated, apart from being pinned once during Aztec Warfare match by Rey Mysterio, but El Dragon Aztec Jr. went up against him, and he was just throwing him around the cage, so the part that made me wince was when he actually threw El Dragon Azteca through the cage. Yeah, so my favourite part about that match was that part, because when Big Show debuted on WWE as the Giant, he in fact threw Stone Cold through a cage on his match with Vince McMahon, and uh, Stone Cold won the match because of that, he was thrown through the cage, he was outside the ring. Um, so we had Dario Cueto say, The match cannot stop this way! Yeah. I can't I, do I, his accent, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I do love it. Like, uh, Melissa Santo started calling, Here's your winner, El Dragon Azteca. And Dario <laughs> just snatched the mic and went, No, this does not count! You do not <laughs> escape Matanza this easily! I should explain that Dario is Matanza's brother, so he has a yeah. vested interest in it. But he was basically saying, That is, does not count! You do not escape Matanza, you will fight him! <laughs> this match must be restarted! Bring the ball! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Dario is so great as a manager. But yeah, I I will admit, I did like that because that would have been way too cheap if it was just, and you win because you had your ass whooped it on you. Because <laughs> yeah, I think that is also a better way to get round in rather than doing uh, what they do in Shane McMahon's matches, which is, um, oh, it's a cage match, but it's also a Falls Count Anywhere match, because that basically tells you, oh, okay, so we're just going to be outside the cage yeah, for that, whatever Yeah, that tells reason. you that the finish is not going to end in Hell in a Cell. It's going <laughs> to yeah. be outside the cell. Like, that's the reason they did that, because they set the match up where Shane did the ridiculous dive from the top of the uh, Hell in a Cell, and you knew that they probably weren't going to be able to get him back in the ring after that. Yeah, but... Coincidentally, that's where Sami Zayn turned evil. Indeed, yes. Um, but yeah, that cage match was the one that felt the most violent because it was Matanza just throwing him, him, uh, throwing him around like crazy, and that still felt a lot more painful to me than seeing the guys that keep continuously bleeding. Because yeah, it worked great for the Hell of War match, but by the time we came to the Triple Threat match and they were bleeding, I was just like, oh god, enough already! That's exactly how I feel about Jeremiah Crane using that pump kick. <laughs> oh yeah. gosh enough already <laughs> that's one pump kick too many yeah I, I was thinking about that triple threat match like oh he's regressed back to okay oh god MVL's not gonna like this <laughs> exactly I mean when he debuted it was pump kick pump kick pump kick that's kind of cool you know jumping front kick you know I'm I'm a fan of it but mm. you've got other moves right yeah <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, it made sense when he initially started, because that was another thing I liked, that initially they introduced him as Ivelisse's dumb boyfriend, but then Ivelisse got injured, so they reworked his character so that he's a full-on heel, like he was actually pretending to love Ivelisse so that he could get to Katrina, and I do like that they addressed this, and he went uh, full-on heel by uh, getting a hammer and smashing Ivelisse's injured ankles. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the problem I have with... uh... Solomon Crow, uh, is that his name in that? Uh, it looks on the ground. It's Jeremiah Crane. But okay, yeah, I yeah. think his actual name is Solomon Crow. The yeah. problem I have with Jeremiah Crane is that I feel like when he was Solomon Crow in NXT, I feel like he's just going to get bored of what he's doing, and if he's not in the limelight, he's just going to leave the company because that's what he did in NXT. He just mm-hmm. left. He had a good spot ahead of him. Uh, it didn't work out, so he left. The same could happen in Lucha Underground. Yeah, that would make sense. I mean, it would also explain why he's gotten a sudden push as of late. I mean, I don't feel like he's undeserving of being used. I just worry that he may just close the door on it, especially with how they film it, where they film a run and then they leave it for a long time when the talent aren't allowed to do anything else on camera. He could end up walking away from that. Yeah. That's had many of the talent before. Indeed, yes. But... There were uh, many other, other awesome matches. Like, even the ones that didn't have a particular story plan, uh, I still did not really enjoyable. Like, I will say that, yeah, it did come out of nowhere, but I still loved the trio's title match and the hastily formed team of The Mac, Killshot, and Dante Fox. Because, well, frankly, they all looked good together, and those three guys had worked their asses off and got insanely over during this past season, so it makes sense why after they won the titles, the fans were chanting, you deserve this. Yeah, it was great to see those guys get a little more exposure, especially to be awarded the Trio's Championships. Yeah. Um, Really good to see if they do get another season, where they develop from that, will there be a bit of distrust between Dante Fox and his partner after? Yeah. Or will it be smooth sailing because they've gone to war and like Battle Brothers, they've joined from the chaos. Yeah, I mean, they did sort of patch over some of their friendship, but uh, in the actual match itself. But it would be interesting to see that friction still remain a little bit. Like, even if it's a slightly more friendlier term, that Dante is the more cocky one who wants to try and do the match himself. And uh, Killshot's still the brooding one who's trying to get him back in line. And Max just the uh, the father in the middle just going, oh, well, you two kids sort each other out already. Yeah. I mean, it's the same as how yourself and I met. We had a big Force Count Anywhere steel cage match. <laughs> and that's where we gained respect for each other and started this podcast. So <laughs> it could work, I guess. Yeah, it was a vicious match. But <laughs> then the big two-hour finale came. And that was where we got some of the big ma- matches. And a lot of the big plot twists as well. Because like you alluded to... El Dragon a second junior versus Matanza. That ended when Black Lotus, who disappeared for like half a season. I honestly, with all the rumors of the contracts, I thought she had just left because the last we had heard of her was Dario going, uh, she's gone back to Hong Kong. I haven't seen her in months. And then she just appears and leaps off the cage onto um uh I I'm trying to remember if she did that to Matanza or El No, she took out El Dragon Azteca first. And then when the match was all over and done with, she attacked Matanza. And yeah, she did. Her. She went for El Dragon Azteca. Then she attacked Matanza uh, with a low blow and then uh, took him out. Of course, he's a monster. He rose right back up mm. and then took out Black Lotus. Maybe once and for all. We don't know. Yeah. Tell you what's really weird is at the end of the show, jumping, jumping ahead a little bit. We'll go back and then get to it. What was up with Rey Mysterio being in the cage? Yeah, I think they dragged him away from, uh, in the Lucha Grounds 100th episode, Rey Mysterio and Matanza fought each other in a one-on-one match where Rey was making it clear that he wanted to end the uh, Queto legacy, but he ended up losing to Matanza, and that was a really great one-on-one match, but it ended with Matanza just carrying Rey Mysterio away, so I guess it's implied that Dario is just keeping Rey there so he can't cause trouble. That was part of the reason why El Dragon Azteca Jr., who is Rey Mysterio's uh, protege in Lucha Underground at the very least, to attack Matanza in the Steel Cage match, and as we've just said, that didn't go out out too well for him. Although, I will say, I do love that... um, I don't know if it's the end of uh, Black Lotus for good, but I do like the fact that... uh, 
Because Dario had started the feud between Black Lotus and El Dragon Azteca by saying, oh yeah, your parents were killed by El Dragon Azteca. And then she found out it was Matanza, which, yeah, kind of makes more sense when you look at it. But uh, she will start screaming, you liar, you liar. And then uh, when Matanza just slammed her down, Dario just picked up the microphone and mockingly said, yes, I'm a liar. I'm a liar. Without just- yeah. I'm a big fan of uh, Dario Cueto. Um, right from the start, when he turned up at AAA Wrestling with a briefcase full of cash and said, Who wants to come to my temple? Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, his character has been consistently appealing and evil. Yeah. throughout the entire seasons. Yeah, he's just such a great heel manager, just because of... Well, partially it's because of the uh, way his actor gives a lot of energy and enthusiasm, but just saw that presence as an oily, smiley person who could not be trusted... Speaking of which, that last... Well, I was about to say the last match, but it ended up being two last matches. Indeed it did. With a man who breaks many arms. Yeah, so the initial main event was Johnny Mundo slash Johnny Impact slash Johnny Nitro slash Johnny Five going up against Chris <laughs> Johnny Five? Johnny Five is alive! <laughs> Yeah, now, Johnny Mundo has been the reigning champion for a long time now, and mainly because, kind of like Jinder Mahal, except he can actually wrestle, <clears throat> Johnny Mundo has had this team of the Worldwide Underground interfering in all their matches, ensuring that he's still the champion no matter what. But he goes up against, uh, he goes up against Prince Puma, who, for the longest time, I thought was going to leave, because... There have been situations where he entered a grave consequences, basically a casket match against Mil Muertes, and he uh, supposedly died. But then Vampiro, one of the commentators and a former luchador himself, brought him back to life. And then he's been going through a dark and edgy phase, but it's very clear that they weren't quite sure what to do with him. They made him uh, wear a black mask and a black hoodie, and he's bowing to Vampiro instead of the audience. But apart from that, he hasn't really done anything heelish, apart from some slightly ag- more aggressive moves. And then he um, won the Queto Cup, which gave him a title opportunity against Johnny Mundo, which made sense because the first ever episode of Lucha Underground, the main event, was these two get up against each other. But... The reason why this match became a lot more interesting is because um, initially it was just going to be for the title, and then Johnny said, oh, if you think you're so coming and beating me, why not put your mask on the line? But then Dario came out saying his classic, hold on! He goes, I like the idea, but we already have a mask versus hair match, and I don't want people thinking we've lost ideas. So why don't you put up your career? Yeah, that was a real telling announcement for me, because I've suspected for a long time that Prince Puma, and as we know from his Twitter antics, has wanted to get away from Lucha Underground for quite a while. Mm. So it came to mind, at least to my ears, that he might be losing this match. Yeah, I was thinking that too. I mean, the only reason why I had any doubt is because in the storyline, like I mentioned last time, Johnny Mundo slash Johnny Impact slash uh, Nitro slash Johnny, this is a running joke in case you can't tell, he's been continuously hinting that I am going to head out for greener pastures. In fact, that was uh, in his match against Rey Mysterio. He threatened that if anyone interfered with the match that he would be taking the title to another promotion which kind of led to um dario interfering when of all people ray mysterio's son interfered with that match that was strange yeah the problem as well with a lot of non-wrestlers make the mark in it actually i don't know if his son is a wrestler or not i don't think so but it was strange because when they have something like that happen it creates the idea that anyone in the crowd could pretty much just come in the ring and attack somebody which is definitely not what they want to have happen yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to have, like, Jinder Mahal appear in this podcast room and attack the Jonah and Monkey for saying he can't wrestle. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was like, no. The best you're a good wrestler, you've just got a really boring moveset. Yeah. That's why I tend to speak favorably on everybody. Yeah. But, yeah, long and short of it is, um, I was thinking that this match could go either way because it seemed like either one of these wrestlers wanted an out. It was just a case of who it was going to be this time. So, 
Puma won the title against Johnny Mundo, which I'm really thankful for because I love Johnny Mundo as a heel. I think he's incredibly charismatic, and I do love the idea they have for his character, which is that he's someone who can wrestle and probably could win the title fairly, but he is so... uh, lacking in confidence that he still feels the need to cheat just in case. Well, I don't know if he's exactly lacking in confidence. Like, he doesn't underestimate his competitors. Yeah. And a lot of the time, if you can cheat, why don't you? Yeah. Like, you can have all the skill and all the ability in the world. You can also probably win a match as well by just cheating a little bit. And that's what gives him the edge, and that's what helps him win in some of those high-profile matches. And it's another thing that when the bad guy is wants to be a bad guy... If, the bad guys often have to win in a scummy way, otherwise yeah. not bad guys. If Johnny Mundo won every match by doing his amazing athletic end of the world move, then you'd think that's pretty cool. You know, he deserved to win that. But if he steals the win by some underhand attack, then you think, ah, oh, damn, I hate Johnny Mundo. Again, again, yeah. he wins a match like that. And that's what they're going for. Yeah, they're definitely going for that. And I like that as a heel because there's an air of unpredictability. Like he will be, like he will cheat, but it might not work. The problem was with the championship match is that it, he was continuously winning because they wanted to drag it out and it became really predictable and boring, especially since... Yeah. The reason I had a problem with his feud with Sexy Star and later on with the Mac, because she passed on that role to him, was that the the main reason he was winning was because the heroes were so dumb they weren't learning anything. Yeah, I remember Sexy Star had the opportunity to take the Mac down to ringside, and she said, no, I need to do this by myself. Yeah. And it's like, why wouldn't you bring him down there? That guy's going to have the whole World Wide Underground with him. Yeah, that one was already bad enough, but then when the mat came in for what turned out, thankfully, to be the stipulation match rather than the championship match, despite the fact that he's already made the same offer to Sexy Star and saw what happened, he then said, okay, Sexy Star, I now feel the exact same way you do. I want to prove that I can do it alone in the ring. It's like, no, you idiots! You saw what happened the last time Sexy Star did that! The definition of madness, I've said it before, (laughs) repeating the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Yeah, so... It's a fine line of how many times you can do the swindle angle as well before it gets to be a bit unwatchable. Yeah. And that was where it was going. Mm. So, thankfully, Johnny Mundo's title reign ended, but Dario then said, hold on, there is a man who won the Gift of the Gods title belt, which, for those who don't want Lucha Underground... It basically gives you the opportunity to have a title match whenever you like. Normally, it's the Money in the Bank briefcase for anyone that watches WWE. Yeah, but normally it comes with the uh, condition that Dario has to know a week beforehand because he wants to promote the fight, so that you can't just do, say, like what Seth Rollins did in one uh, WrestleMania and just use it to attack Roman Reigns when he was tired after losing to whoever he was fighting at the time and taking the title from him that way. Well... And actually, that's uh, that's a really weird one, because on that WrestleMania, rather than make a new title match, Seth Rollins came out with a briefcase, and he made it into a freeway, um, because it was Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar. Hmm. And for that fight, it became a freeway, uh, so somebody could take the title away from Brock. So <laughs> Seth Rollins beat Roman Reigns with the curb song, which is a movie he's not allowed to do anymore, because, you know, they had that head trauma suit. Mm. And uh, they even cut that out of replays, in fact. So Seth Rollins changed the pedigree, and they changed it to some sort of weird knee strike. But yeah. anyway, that's how they got the title away from Brock Lesnar. Without yeah. having to lose. So yeah, normally that's the type of thing that can't happen, but Dario was like, well, it is Ultima Lucha, so what the hell? He'll go up against the Gift of the Gods champion, Pentagon Duck. Yeah, the breaker of all of the arms. Uh, recently breaking uh, Famous B's arm to the delight of Tejano and then Brenda's arm, uh, which caused a lot of trouble. Tejano, by the way, uh, becoming a client of Famous B. Yeah. Like, to Dr. Wagner Jr. Yeah, that was an interesting twist in Ultimate Lucha, but yeah. yeah. the thing that happened. Now you mention it about the ridiculous injuries and about everyone uh, bleeding and it being ridiculous. Everyone gets their arm broken in Lucha Underground and seemingly heals in a couple of weeks. Yeah, it's... This weird, it's a really odd gimmick to have. Basically, for those who don't know, like Pentagon Duck, that's his weird gimmick, is that after every single match, he tries to break someone's arm. And even in this case, during the match, where he broke Prince Puma's arm. For those who didn't watch my short-lived Lucha Underground review series of Monkey Chatter, 
I mentioned that Pentagon Doug is an anti-hero style figure who is insanely popular, and I really don't know why. Well, Pentagon Doug has a very interesting character. He has a very unique visual style. Um, his mask and his makeup under the mask and his presentation is mm. quite different to the typical luchador mask and get up with the you know what you'd re- regular what you normally have with wrestling tights and a sort of generic mask he's very different mm. he's very true. dark and he's very interesting he reminds you a lot and it's probably why the pairing happened of vampiro's appearance with that white makeup yeah and he does have the catchphrase of sierra nero or zero fear which is very easy yes. for the crowd to chant so yeah i do uh, it's not entirely like i do get some of why he's popular but it's just that he's such a despicable sadistic character which would be fine if he was a heel but he's often portrayed as the face or at the very least uh, some some kind of tweener that's always the one you want to cheer for which yeah i really don't get that because he keeps breaking everyone's arms for no reason it's the same way people cheer brock lesnar when brock lesnar is shouldn't really be a baby face he doesn't wrestle as much as everyone else so everyone should probably hate him and yet, what he does in the ring is so entertaining, for the limited amount of time he does do it, that it makes people forget about that. Similar, Pentagon and Dark wrestles in a very exciting way. And he does a lot of really cool moves, like the flip pile driver and the package pile driver. Mm. And not to mention, he breaks people's arms all the time. Yeah. Uh, which seems to be something he just gets away with. Yeah, I mean... He's very enticing that way. Yeah, I think the only time he'd ever been part of the story was after the Gauntlet match, which, by the way, was still one of my favourite matches in Season 3, when uh, afterwards both Black Lotus and El Dragon as second junior came up to break both of his arms as revenge for him breaking up his feud for no reason other than I want to announce my new name change. I mean... You get uh, a lot of times when people should be punished because uh, Baron Corbin pushed the official when he was uh, doing some backstage attacks. Uh, he pushed the official. He got fined for pushing the official, not for hurting someone backstage when he went in a wrestling match. Yeah. Similar sort of thing happened with Alicia Fox when she was attacking Sasha Banks. She was beating up Sasha Banks outside of a match, just beating her down and then pushed the official and got fined for it. So it's fine to beat up someone if they're a wrestler any time of the day. <laughs> you can kick their ass... And it's fine, no repercussions. And yet, if you push a referee who's not a wrestler, then you're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, at least Lucha Underground gets away with it with the fact that, as the title implies, it's an underground fighting ring. Yeah. Probably not going to be leading with the rules. Although, I will have to say, now that you've reminded me of it, one of my favorite moments, like, it was so ridiculously comedic, but after all the crap those guys have gone through, I did love that, okay, there was one spot in the Johnny Mundo Puma match which was so ridiculous, but I loved it anyway. Uh, Puma accidentally knocks one of the referees out. So, Worldwide Underground dragging another referee. Well, From the after, back, yeah. Yeah, after Johnny has um, pinned him. But after um, Puma kicked out at a two count, the Worldwide Underground got so mad and beat up the second referee. Oh, yeah, I know what you're bringing into now, because the referee got so hyped and so mad that when the opponents were thrown out of the ring, he hypes up, and he does an outside dive! I know! Well, almost does an outside dive. He sort of grabbed the ropes, flipped himself, and then hit the apron, and yeah. his legs maybe hit tire. Yeah, but still, I love the idea that for <laughs> once, a referee after being thrown around actually goes, you know what, fuck you all! <laughs> you know, I think I saw Earl Hebner kick a guy once, which is funny. <laughs> but then again, Earl Hebner's famous for his uh, Montreal screw job, but yeah. we won't talk about that. In NXT, there were tons of backstage attacks from the Undisputed Era with Adam Cole, Bobby Fish, and that lot coming in. And I think William Regal actually said that's not how wrestling works. The action is in the ring. I've advised them not to do it again. And they did it again the next week. And they did it again the next week, and they attacked, uh, they attacked wrestlers backstage. So it's like people have shown up from nowhere, and they've attacked wrestlers. What happens? Well, of course, they get a contract, and they get to fight. Uh, Is that going to encourage mad people to <laughs> just attack wrestlers backstage? Yeah. Uh, if I do this, I, this is how you get a title shot. <laughs> Sorry, championship opportunity. My bad. Uh, but yeah, that's the reason why, again, Lucha Underground pro- portrayed itself as an underground fighter room works. But yeah, I do like the fact they rarely, like, there have been a couple of times throughout history, but uh, unless they're like a wrestler being a guest referee, 
this is like one of the few times you actually get to see a referee give someone else come up and sort of kicking them around because the Lucha Underground have been attacking a lot of referees and somehow not getting themselves disqualified as part of it. Yeah, it was it was a beautiful moment and a very well attempted outside dive. I'll keep it that. <laughs> yeah. I think he probably hurt himself way more yeah, than he hurt I, anyone else. Yeah, literally the dive didn't look like it should have hurt anyone, but I just love the idea of it, really. <laughs> But, yeah, so the match happened between Puma and Pentagon. Pentagon broke Puma's arm very early on, so it meant that Puma was already fighting as a disadvantage from the word go on top of his exhaustion. And then on top of that, part of the reason why Puma was going through a dark and edgy phase was because Vampiro resurrected him and was training him as a student, well, a rebound student, I guess you could say, because in the climax of Ultima Lucha Dos, the season two finale, Pentagon uh, took issue with Vampiro's coaching and beat him in the middle of the ring with a bat wrapped with barbed wire. Yes, that was, it was actually really fantastic to see uh, Vampiro get into these uh, interactions. Um, Vampiro, sometimes he plays his character a bit too strong, and his commentary gets a little unbearable. Oh, God, yeah. Like, I'm not saying I'd rather have David Otonga. No, but I do know <laughs> what you mean. That's the one thing I will say against it, that when um, Prince Puma first showed up in his dark form, and uh, Matt Striker was doing his job, I was saying, wow, he seems to be staring at... Uh, he has his new appearance. He seems to be staring at you, Vampiro. What's up with that? And Vampiro basically... Instead of looking like a uh, master of disguise, he ended up like a sulky teenager. Just like, no, don't go into my business, man. It, it's nothing. Just go away. Just go away. I'm not doing that. Yeah, I mean, that. there's certainly been some really weird times with Vampiro. There was a time when uh, a man was fighting a woman in one of the matches and he was chopping her. And Vampiro said that he shouldn't be doing that. It's a wrestling match. They're fighting. They should be fighting. Uh. You know. As inappropriate as it might get, this is a fight. And there's other times when there's been a lot of violence going on and he's just been going... Mmm, mmm, violence, yeah. yeah. And it's like, that's not really good television audio. <laughs> yeah, that, oh, he just goes into one of those long rambles, like, well, you see, the wrestlers, you fight, you go into this dark place, and anything is legal, you will cut someone, you will bleed. It's like, okay, yeah, I get it, you're the dark commentator, we get it, can we please yeah. move on and focus on the match? It is really good to have uh, Vampira there, he is, uh, he can, it brings a lot of insight. Um, I just feel like since Matt Stryker is doing so much, he's doing the play-by-play, and he's doing a lot of the story as well. Like, it might be good to have a third commentator. Yeah. Hey, maybe put a woman on commentary. That would be cool. So, yeah. Hey, put a woman on commentary. It didn't work out with Rene Young, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of people who are good talkers out there. There's uh, good uh, commentators from Shimmer, uh, Women's Wrestling, like... You know, it might be nice to mix it up a little bit. But then again, I worry that maybe uh, Matt Strike and Vampiro wouldn't behave themselves with one on commentary. Yeah, although <laughs> that said, I think the commentary team may be broken up because uh, one of the bits is that actually kind of almost a parody of what you were saying during that entire Prince Puma vs. Pentagon on Matt. Like, Matt Strike is doing the commentary and Vampiro is just silently staring and uh, Matt Strike is going, Hey, Vampiro, can you help me out here? I'm doing all the talking. I need someone else to say something. <laughs> and then uh, Vampiro Hero reveals that his master plan, which is that at the moment Prince Puma might have been having some success, uh, Vampiro dragged Pentagon out of the way and it directly interfered with the match. And that ultimately led to Prince Puma's failure. And Crawl credit to Max Stryker, he really sold that moment because he then suddenly abandons culture and goes around saying, Vampiro, what are you doing? You're destroying this guy's dreams. This is his career on the line. This sucks. You know, like, so I'm wondering if they're going to continue that and have it so that Vampiro is now like an uh, advisor to Pentagon, or at least in appearance, and someone else is in commentary. I think Vampiro has... Um left the commentary position for character purposes one too many times. It might be better to see him as a manager, possibly for Pentagon. We're not really sure if Pentagon became the master, and that's what was going on there. We're not really sure if there's another, a greater deity. I think we saw someone at the end. Yeah, we did, and I'll get into that in a bit. That's why I said in appearances, but yeah, it seems like the commentary team might be broken up after this. So yeah, Pentagon Dalek is now the champion, which I'm sure has made a lot of people happy. And we got a montage that's just a whole long series of... Um, it's like a... The whole montage is about, I want to say, five, ten minutes. But it was with loads of short plot twists to try and build up for season four, if it ever happens. Uh, again, more on that later. Because, okay, 
One other big surprise, King Queno, a wrestler that literally hasn't been seen for an entire season because he was supposed to have lost a death match against Mil Huetes, suddenly shows up and took away the gauntlet of power from him. That was already a big deal. We then had stuff like, um, as you said, Sexy Star continued to be tormented by the Spider Tribe whenever they show up, although I have a feeling that... Um, Given that she's been blacklisted in a lot of companies, I have a feeling she's going to be killed off screen like Daga was. And I say was because, as it turns out, Daga's back and he killed off one of the members of the Snake Tribe in order to take their place. It's all crazy. Yeah. And then the biggest one of the night, and the reason why I suspect Vampiro may end up becoming the uh, master or manager of Lucha on the ground is because, actually, two things happened. First off, um, it's revealed that this was all part of... um, Vampiro's master plan on orders from a new dark entity with a skull face. There's another entity as well that we don't know about that is in the limousine, uh, possibly like a high up ranking position in the city or something like that. That's been pulling the strings involved in the gauntlet as well. We don't know if these are linked either. Yeah, we don't know if they're linked or if it's a rival faction, but... Yeah, it's implied that Vampiro's been deliberately setting up Prince Puma for a fall, which admittedly is one of those storylines when you think back and you realise, wait wait a minute, that doesn't make sense, why would Vampiro do this? But I think it's one of those things where they pretty much had to do it because there was literally no other way of saving that storyline, because whilst I am sad that Prince Puma's gone since he was one of the bigger, most exciting uh, faces or heroes in the company... You can clearly tell they didn't know what to do with him for the longest time, so it's probably for the best that he left now, especially if he's been eager to get out of his contract. Yeah, like. I mean, he's very happy to be finally able to stand on his own feet. Potentially, wherever he ends up, he'll be able to play a character he wants to play. Mm. And um, it was heavily suggested that Vampiro doesn't care about the person he's managing. Vampiro wanted to get what he wanted, not necessarily to help um, Prince Puma. Indeed. So... Vampiro's working with a skull entity, and it's implied that he and Pentagon Dark could take over this match, although it's implied that Vampiro is now also going to take up Pentagon in some way, which, if he did take up the big manager role of Lucha Underground, that would be pretty huge. And now I know what you're thinking. Isn't that going to clash with Dario Cueto since he actually owns it? Well, <laughs> funny story. Dario, as um, Envial mentioned, he's been communicating with some other big high-up figure in the limousine, who it was implied might take the ring eventually at some point. They teased it might happen in this um, Ultimate Lucha Trends, but it didn't happen in the end. Uh, like, I believe he threatened to uh, come and attack Cage if he won the gauntlet. Yeah, but that didn't happen this time round. Uh, this time round, one of his associates was having a drink with Dario, and Dario said, Okay, look, I didn't expect King Quetta, but I promise I'll get it back. I have people looking for it. And the guy goes, Oh, that's no problem. Uh, you get a pass this time. Because you're dead. And he just shoots him through the chest. Yeah, that was pretty good. I like how he was holding the uh, bull statue as well. Mm. A lot of meaning to that for um, Dario Cueto, as that's uh, the item that his brother used to smash his father's head in. Or was it their mother's, actually? Yeah, I think it was their mother's yeah. head, because that's the thing. The uh, one possible lifeline that could either um, save him or possibly replace him with someone unequally uh, termed it is that as he's lying there bleeding with shotgun wounds, he goes to the phone and uh, calls his father and then passes oh, out. Oh, yeah. Okay, so he calls his father, yeah. Because their mother was pretty bad to yeah. them. Uh, very abusive. So mm. his brother, Matanza, killed her with that statue. And that's, that's what he was holding as he died mm. before he called his father. Yeah. I say that. He might not be dead. It's full of the supernatural. Yeah, it's full of the supernatural. It's possible, or it might just be that someone gets to him in time to save him, which I hope, because, again, Dario is, like, an excellent heel manager and a great, and just sort of a, a great personality to have, especially in moments like, one example from early on in Season 3, the I Quit match, where he just sort of, after it looked like Rey Mysterio had been uh, disqualified because of some Guerrero cheating, he just popped up out and, and just went, Barry! You're kidding me, right? A disqualification in my main event? You know how much Dario Cueto loves violence! Yeah, and having said that, we got confirmation, finally, confirmation of what we all suspected, that Katrina is in fact a spirit. Mm, and yeah, looking that's to get, true. Looking to get her body back uh, through some nefarious means. We could see, I don't know if we will, but uh, Dario Cueto could reappear at points 
as a spirit. That's something that could happen. Mm, maybe a different kind true. of spirit. Maybe a tortured soul that only lives in the office, sort of speaking to people. Yeah, that would be really cool if that happened, actually. Or even if someone just saw them and they weren't real. Yeah, <laughs> that would That'd be, be cool. cool. Like, oh man, imagine if uh, the only one who could see was Rey Mysterio. That would be just mad. <laughs> yeah, or maybe he's talking to Matanzo and Matanzo can hear him and mm. he's telling Matanzo what's going on. Yeah. As a way to communicate with the audience because Matanza doesn't speak. Yeah, that would be re- really great. But yeah, this is all conjecture at this point, and it's kind of unfortunate that um, normally I, th- I would just end this section with, yeah, this is all great. I'm really excited for season four. Season four is questionable right now. Yeah, so there's no deal for season four on the table. Having said that, Netflix will be showing the current seasons. I think they. I think they'll be having season three. They've got one and two on there right now, mm. so it is being broadcast. There's probably a want. I mean, the fans want it another season. Yeah, the it's fans just are... who's going to pay for it. That's the problem. Yeah, because the fans are excited to see it. Netflix kind of like it. I think it's something like El Rey Network. In a real confusing fashion, that they want it on the network, but they don't want to pay much for it. And the last yeah. rumor was that. An investor put money up front for it, but only enough to, so that it would come back as a low-budget version of it. Yeah, I imagine they don't want to bring it back with a low budget. They probably want to make it look good. Yeah. And a problem they're having is the way they shoot it as a TV show, the wrestlers really hate being on these contracts. That's why a lot of them are leaving. Mm. And are they going to be able to bring back all of the talent that they had last season? Unlikely, because a lot of those guys have already gone on to other TV deals. Yeah, that's the main problem. I mean, some of them they've been able to write get-out clauses for if that happens. Like, again, like I said, with Johnny Mundo, they uh, had him saying, I'm going to go to the Greener Pastors if this happens. And, yeah, Prince Puma, they just ended it on a big finale. But, yeah, it would be really awkward if someone like, again, Pentagon Dark's the champion now. He just suddenly walked out. That would be a really huge blow. So, Yeah, at the very least, they need to bring back their champions. Hmm. Well, I mean, worst comes to worst, there could be a new location for the shoot, and it could be a different person saying, this is my temple. Mm. But then, is it the same show if they do that? Yeah, it's always one of those big worries. Because Dario is dead, so they could start another storyline up with a different temple. Yeah, but it's one of those things where, I mean, I should say not all of the wrestlers are unhappy with it, because you do get people like Will Mack and... Um, Oh, I forget his actual name, but the guy who plays Marty the the Moth have spoken very positively about it on their Twitter pages, and I'm actually saying uh, they were really excited about some of the stuff to do in the finale. Black Lotus, even with her small amount of appearances, has said that it's one of her favourite projects ever, so... Martin Cassius, yeah, was very popular about it for Marty the Moth. Marty Martinez, as he was known in Lucha Underground. Ah, yeah, you're right, so... I think a lot of the wrestlers that still work with uh, AAA Lucha Libre Worldwide, they're pretty safe because AAA Wrestling has a good working relationship with Lucha Underground. They were allowed to appear on AAA and Lucha. Hmm. Um, uh, but it's one of those frustrating things because on the one hand, with stuff like Dario uh, suddenly dying and his heroes leaving, then you could essentially say that this was a, a good ending for it. I mean, it would be a dark ending, but it would still be good. It but... would be a bad ending, but I think the fact that you have uh, Rey Mysterio in a prison cell and you have uh, Matanza Aquino next to him, like, what's going on there? You can't leave it there. Like, are we led to believe that Mysterio just dies yeah. in prison cell? That would be a pretty terrible way for that to end. Yeah, it's one of those things where I really would love it to continue, especially since... Um... Admittedly, there's going to be some bias to this because it was my first wrestling show that I really got into. And it's funnily enough, you mentioned uh, your day of reckoning Let's Play. That's what actually got me into it because I remember thinking of liking the uh, colorful style of Lucha Libre. And then you sort of said in your Let's Play, oh, uh, but by the way, I totally recommend Lucha Underground. And I started watching that and haven't been able to stop since, even though they still That's have not crazy. released I it. I completely a- forgot about that. I thought it was when we were talking on the Danger Zone. About uh, uh, wrestling when we did the uh, that bit. That was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the reasons why I picked it up. But yeah, it just sort of ticks the right boxes for me because, yeah, I will freely admit, it doesn't matter whether it's video games or wrestling, what can really hook me in is if the writing is really good, and that's part of the reason why I 
been sticking with Lucha Underground so long because it's just the right boxes in that you've got great wrestling, it's just the right length, and you have good stories that are continuously developing characters. Like, if WWE was shorter and had better writing, then yeah, maybe I would pay nine ninety nine a month for the <laughs> Well, that's the thing. If you pay nine ninety nine, you still don't get Raw and SmackDown. Mm, but yeah, that's the yeah. frustrating thing, especially yeah. in the UK. Yeah, it's like it's been a few weeks and they still haven't announced the next season, and it's getting yeah. kind of worrying well, now. It's engaging and it's a good show to watch. But as well as being a couple of weeks since it finished broadcasting, it's been a long time since they finished filming. Oh, that's so a good point as well. Yeah, it's been that amount of time and they still haven't reached a deal. You've got to wonder if they will. And like. I don't really want to see them do like a TV style movie where they wrap it up in one episode. Mm. Like that's worst case scenario if they have to end it. I would very much like to see another season Mm. and for them to continue on this uh, great television that they're running. I mean, it might be that they have to maybe not use quite as many beautiful cinematics, but I guess if the writing was still good, it would be bearable. But yeah, it's one of those things where it, you have to wonder if it's if that style of wrestling is just too expensive to run, especially if it breaks the mold in ways that are frustrating for other wrestlers. Like, maybe they are going to have to adjust their contracts somewhat by maybe just saying, okay, as long as you don't appear as this, then yeah, you can go elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, they tend to rename wrestlers when they come to a different organization anyway. Everyone's familiar with that. Everyone's okay with it. Like I said, I really hope that it's all just doom mongering that eventually they do find someone who can, I guess, fit the huge bill. Yeah, I don't really know what other promotion I would go for. Like, maybe Progress, because some of the promos would be good on that. But, yeah, I genuinely don't know if there's any other promo that can uh, well, get the right edge. in the age of digital media, there's certainly a ton of things out there. Like I say, too many to watch. And there might not be another Lucha Underground out there, but there's definitely a lot of content. So, yeah, I could, guess I could probably find somewhere, but it is still... I. Once you get started on a story, you really do want to see it to the end. And God damn it, Lucha Underground has been building up way too many surprises and twists for it to just end up right now. Yeah, that's understandable. It really mm. has built us in with a lot of the characters, and I would like to know where they're headed with a lot of that. Mm. So, yeah, I guess the long shot of it is Ultima Lucha Trez, great. Please, season four, please. Yeah, fingers crossed. If that's lucky or unlucky, I'm going to do it anyway. Hmm. I mean, yeah, it might be that, uh, I guess the best case scenario would be that if it gets closed, but there's at least, like, one last big show to wrap it all up, even if it is slightly lower budget. I mean, yeah, it, granted, it would be a bit rushed if, oh, the guy in the limo just walks into the room and says, hi, I'm evil, but still. Yeah, I mean, my fear about them doing something like that is you definitely knew, um, you definitely know if they did a TV-style movie that that would be the end of it. Mm. So, Ideally, I'd want to hear talk about a TV series. I mean, they made it to season three. It didn't look like that was going to happen, and that happened. Oh, wait, was there money problems before then, though? Yeah, because of the long gaps between the uh, seasons. Oh, Not yeah, necessarily had... money problems, but uh, just getting it back on the road. Mm-hmm. Like, they wanted to change their filming location, which they still may be doing. I mean, I know also they had to have a, a break in between seasons, which, uh, I mean, admittedly, it ended That was uh, due to talent unrest as well. yeah. I knew about that because admittedly they chose a good time to end it on that match where Matanza slammed an El Dragon Azteca Jr. through the bleachers. But yeah, that was also when you said that wasn't planned, it does make kind of sense. <laughs> yeah, so they did take a break due to talent unrest because uh, a lot of people just weren't happy. Let's see if I find any information here. Hmm. That's the, kind of the problem with Lucha Underground and because it's not as big as the WWE, there's a lot less uh, people trying to find any kind of information on it. Like, if this was... Uh, if there was a day to WWE going behind the scenes, you would have people continuously flooding you with information and rumours that you wouldn't know what was true or not. Okay, yeah, they were... They did announce that they'd be renewed for a third season when they finished season two, so it wasn't as bad as it was for this season. Hmm. But they didn't know if they would be continuing. Yeah, this is the unfortunate problem right now. I mean, it's got a lot of promise. Uh, well received by fans and critics. IMDb gave it a season review for the first season, at least 9 out of 10. Hmm. And yeah, like you said, it's on Netflix America. Please bring it over to the UK. But um... <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm talking about with the WWE Network being awkward for the UK. Because um, I can't watch the shows really when they're broadcast because it's at 1am for us in the UK. So hmm. I would like to be able to switch on the network and watch it the next day at a reasonable time. But yeah, getting back on the topic... I just, yeah, it's one of those things where I love each other so much, I really, really hope it is maintained, even if it's 
kind of, I mean, who knows, there might be some deals going on in the background that they're not telling fans, but it does sound like I'm clutching at straws at this point. I mean, it's pretty hush-hush right now, but I imagine they must be able to work something out. One would hope, because it's not, I mean, yeah, it's, it's not exactly the biggest thing ever right now, but it has, like you said, got a lot of good social media numbers, a lot of good critics. It's a show that knows its identity, and it's a show that is consistently good. Mm. And that's pretty much the reason why we want to see it come back, because it's a great show. And, yeah, I guess that's all that needs to be said for now, and I guess that rather awkwardly brings us to an end of this month with another cliffhanger. As Jonah wanders in the wasteland of no wrestling shows between mid-seasons of Lucha Underground Season 3 <laughs> Season 4, that's it from me, MVL Gaming. We've had the Jonah Monkey. Thank you for watching the podcast. Come see us next time. If you're still there, hopefully the arena's not empty. <laughs> There's a guy with a gun pointing at me. He's not very happy about stuff we said earlier. Yeah. That's fine. It's okay. I don't think that gun has anything but pyro in it. Oh, it definitely doesn't have pyro in it. They don't use that anymore. Yeah. Well, it depends on the series. I mean, if you've got a dilapidated boat, I think you're fine. <laughs> uh, so with that, thank you for watching, everybody, if indeed you still are, and we'll catch you next time. See you.